That'll do it. Hey, what's up, y'all? My name is Agent Psycho, aka Toa Sniper 98, but you can just call me too. So, Genshin Impact's been out for over a year by this point, and because I've spent way too much fucking money on this game, I need to make a video or two about it with the shittiest editing you're gonna see on YouTube, because my broke gotcha ass can't afford a proper editor to at least partially justify all the wailing I've done so far. So here we are. I've been doing this how-to video style for the past couple of years for another gacha game called Fate Grand Order, which is the first gacha game I've ever played, and am still playing to this day, unfortunately. I took this concept from another YouTuber named Gregor, who's done his on Rainbow Six Siege and more recently on Valorant, link to his channel in the description. As the title should already convey to you, I'll be showing you gameplay of every single character in Genshin Impact, categorized by region and in alphabetical order. I'll tell you their rarity, element, weapon class, skill and ult, and role or roles, plural, if they have multiple, as well as general advice on various aspects of their gameplay, such as weapons and artifact sets. For full disclosure, I'll be using parts of the character build spreadsheet made by the Genshin Helper team to help me cover parts of this video that I might otherwise overlook while making it, so shoutouts to the people in charge of making and maintaining the spreadsheet for the better part of the past year. Y'all are the real MVPs. The link to this spreadsheet will be down in the description as well. If there's anything notable, that you guys think I missed for a particular character, feel free to add your own tips and tricks in the comments below. I don't claim to know everything about this game, I'm just here to make you wish you had some of these characters, which is kind of like me trying to cope with the fact that I've sent a Chinese dev studio way too much of my money over the course of the past year. Two disclaimers that I want to make first, just so that we're clear. First, this is not a tier list, because tier lists for gacha games have always been and always will be trash, with the one exception being those for booba size. Second disclaimer, for the most part, I won't be taking constellations into account, especially not for 5-star characters. I may discuss them for some characters if they're relevant to what I'm talking about, but I'll try to keep that to a minimum here. And a quick shill here before we get started, I have a Twitch channel as well, same as my YouTube here, twitch.tv forward slash toasniper98. So stop by if you have questions about the characters or the game, or in general if you just want to hang out and chill. Alright, got all the boring shit out of the way, let's start with the first region, Mondstadt. Five star Geo Support Saber, specifically a damage support, though it's probably more accurate to call him an off field DPS instead. Alera's Genshin Husbando puts down a Geo Field with the help of a drop shield he stole from Halo as his skill. It blasts enemies in the face with Geo attacks whenever you attack them within the field in two second intervals. It also serves as a shitty elevator with all the functionality of one, too. If someone stands on it for a moment, it'll go up into the air but stop halfway at a fair height because it stopped working and you have to call emergency services because you're stuck up there pondering what the hell kind of bad life decisions you've made to get to the point where you're playing Genshin Impact. The elevator does get you well out of reach of a lot of melee characters, and your characters can also plunge attack off it if you want to do that for whatever reason, but since plunge attacks are mainly for Xiao mains who enjoy brainless pogo stick gameplay, or Kazuha enjoys who actually have a use for their plunge attacks, it's mostly a meme. Eh, but most of the time you'll just get trolled by the elevator dragging your character up with it because they accidentally dashed over it and plunge attacked off it while auto attacking if you're not using it for exploration. And no, Albedo C4 isn't gonna make any better, unless you run Zhao and Albedo together like a mad lad. Bob Ross's Burst is an AoE Geo Blast that's basically a bigger version of the ones his skill makes, but if you use his skill before his ult, the ult will then cause seven more Geo explosions to go off within the field. Think of it as a really big cluster grenade, like the one from Black Ops 4, or the one Raze uses that you always die from in Valorant. If you ult before using his skill, it won't get the seven follow-up blasts, so make sure to always use his skill before his ult, which shouldn't be an issue, I think because who the fuck ults with Albedo before using his skill? Your main objective with Albedo is to tactically spam the E button, or whatever your button is if you're not playing on PC for some godforsaken reason, whenever you rotate to him for maximum geo field uptime. It also has a 4 second cooldown with a 30 second duration, so maintaining that skill uptime is really challenging, especially for gacha game players. So fair warning to you aspiring Albedo mains out there. Sprinkle his ult into his skill spam and there you go, you now know how to play Zeke from Fate Apocrypha. 
However, if you see 2, note that you can no longer mindlessly spam his skill and ults anymore like a Papega, because his ult gains more damage the more times you trigger the Geo Blasts on his skill, up to 4 times. Albedo is currently, at the time of this recording, the only sword user in the game who scales with defense. This means that Cinnabar Spindle is more or less tailor-made for him because who the hell else are you gonna use it on? If you're too lazy to play the event that gave you Cinnabar, then Harbinger Dawn should be his next default since it's only a 3-star weapon, so even you free-to-plays should have at least a few copies of that lying around. Primordial Jade Cutter and Freedom Sworn are also options for him if you're a whale and or you're an albedo simp and you really want to give him a 5-star weapon option, but understand that they're more specialty or niche weapons for him that'll cause him to deviate from his base game plan a little bit if you care to play optimally with him. 4-Piece Husk is his new best artifact set just because it's a defense-based 5-star set. You can cheese his 4-Piece effect really easily by doing literally nothing but have albedo off-field for 12 seconds before initiating any fight. Otherwise, Two-Piece Husk and Two-Piece Archaic Petra is probably his next best set. He can also run more support-oriented sets too, like Four-Piece Noblesse or Four-Piece Tenacity, since he triggers their effects really easily and can provide even more damage support to your team in those ways. Just don't confuse him for some big titty demon girl who wants to get boned by a skeleton wearing a cape. He probably already has his hands full dealing with Klee's mom. 4 star who? Use Amber as an exploration bot to do pyro puzzles since she's one of only two pyro archers in the game and the other one's a limited 5 star that you didn't roll, whereas the game gives you a copy of Amber for free because it knows how useless she is outside of overworld stuff. That's it. I could end it there, but for the sake of the three Amber mains out there watching this video, I won't do her dirty. Outside of her being a puzzle bot, Red Pomu is a 4-star pyro support archer. Her skill has her deploy a timed thermite charge disguised as a doll of herself that taunts enemies around at first before it explodes. Tapping this skill has Amber toss her doll right in front of herself quickly, but holding this skill lets you control her throwing arc, and the longer you hold, the further she'll throw the doll. Just tapping this skill is preferable in combat since enemies will just smack you in the face otherwise, like your Asian parents did to you for not getting straight A's in grade school. But holding this skill is useful, and the overworld for some puzzles, so keep that in mind. Her ult is a miniature version of Caster Gilgamesh's Noble Phantasm, where she shoots an arrow shower into the air that lands onto whatever target she locks onto, which is the nearest enemy to Amber at the time. By far its best use, or perhaps more accurately its only use, is to break enemy shields, notably Cryo Abyss Mage shields, which will shatter completely off a single Amber ult if it connects fully, making her the hard counter to Cryo Abyss Mages in case you literally have no other Pyro character on your roster. Amber's default role as a support is to spam her taunt as often as possible since it's a legitimately good piece of utility that's actually quite rare across the Genshin roster, especially for those tower defense stages in Abyss that you keep failing to 3 star. The taunts don't seem to have as good of a taunt range as you'd hope they'd have, so sometimes enemies will still chase after you or the objective, which is even worse, even when you think they should have been taunted. However, if she wakes up one day and chooses violence and you think your name is Shroud, you can run her as a pyro DPS archer instead. This is possible thanks to her passive that that gives her bonus damage for specifically hitting enemy weak points, and it's usually the way those three Amber mains I mentioned at the beginning tend to use her since it's obviously a very active playstyle and involves a bit more gameplay and, dare I say, SKILL than just mindlessly spamming your E and Q buttons all day. Just remember that some enemies don't have weak points for Amber to hit, so if you run into them, I hope your Amber is at least C4, otherwise she ain't doing shit. Also, just for the sake of those Amber mains I keep talking about, I hope y'all aren't playing on mobile, cause you definitely aren't hitting shit in the first place either. For support, give her an energy recharge bow, like Favonius or Sacrificial, preferably Sac Bow, since as a support, your Amber probably won't have shit for crit stats, and she can use her taunt sooner if Sac Bow's passive triggers. She'll also take that Elegy that you got from losing the sort of coin flip on Safahoma's last raid up, which you can put to surprisingly good use actually, because of the synergy between its passive and her ult. You got quite a few options for DPS Amber though. Famous Amos is by far the best, since it works with Amber's charge shot playstyle, followed by Thundering Pulse and Skyward Harp, and and then Prototype Crescent, which is more or less the free-to-play version of Amos. For artifacts, 4-Piece Noblesse is her go-to support set, naturally. Combine that with a copy of Elegy, and your Amber becomes a support powerhouse with double attack buffs, an EM buff, and a taunt. 
and just ignore the fact that Bennett exists. Four Piece Wanderers is default for a charge shot Amber, but if you have her at C4 for some reason because you rolled Wanderlust Invocation way too many times before you realize that's the wrong banner to be spending your Prima Gems on, Four Piece Crimson Witch becomes an option in case you're interested in watching the world burn with Baron Bunnies because you're sick and tired of people calling your waifu and Genshin trash. 4 Star Hydra Support Caster. You can redeem a free copy of her after you complete most of the Mondstadt main questline, which is good since you'll probably need a more dedicated healer than the C0 Noel you started the game with if you even bothered rolling the beginner banner at all when you started. Barb skill puts a ring of water around herself, which stays even if you switch her off to another character. If you keep her on the field, the skill allows her to heal the party off of her normal attacks and charge attack. It's not a lot, but it does heal the entire party at the same time, meaning that you can heal up your other party members safely without exposing them to further damage, which is worth noting. It also has the rather notorious property of infusing your active character with Hydro for a split second every 5 seconds after Barbara activates it. If your character has an element that's not Hydro on them, these Hydro pulses will cleanse them, but if they're affected by Cryo, then naturally they're gonna get frozen in place. So try not to bring her against cryo enemies, otherwise you're going to be spending half the fight spamming your spacebar and wondering why your Barbara isn't just named Bruh instead. Her ult's quite simple. You hit Q, Barbara does cute little spin and jump in place, and your whole team gets fully healed because of how cute that was. The scaling on the health that she gives with her ult is huge. Even without heavy gear investment, Barbara can basically max heal your DPSs off of a single ult, assuming you understand the concept of leveling your character's talents. And not only does it have the whole heal heal the entire team thing from before, but it also heals instantly, which is a rare trait for healers. Support Barb has a very passive playstyle, which involves you only pulling her out when you want to heal someone on your team before switching to someone else who doesn't just tickle enemies by splashing water on them and actually does damage. You can initiate fights with the point Barbara by using your skill first, then switching to your other characters so that her skill can heal them while they're in combat, but that might get you into a bad habit of always doing that, because when you need to fight cryo enemies with Barb on your team, you might hit her skill out of muscle memory and end up freeze locking your team for half the fight. If you think dedicated healer rolls are for pussies though, you're in luck because just like Amber, Barbara too can wake up and choose violence with a dedicated DPS build instead. If you really want to invest your precious free to play resources on trying to make a girl who basically just squirts enemies to death squirt harder. And finally, at C6, Hannah Barbara has an instant revive for one character if they die. When they do, the game will switch to another character on your team, but they'll be instantly healed back to full since the revive is automatic. This only happens once every 15 minutes, so it's only meant to be an emergency resort and not something you should rely on while you're struggling to 36 star abyss. For weapons, Support Barbara defaults to Thrilling Tales since it complements her passive playstyle the best and it's just a 3 star weapon, you should have it. Alternatives are Prototype Amber, Favonius Codex, or Wine and Song, which are all 4 stars, and Prototype Amber even being craftable. In comparison, DPS weapons for Barbara are considerably more whale. Her two best are Scoured Atlas and Lost Prayer, followed by a plethora of four stars that she probably can't use too efficiently other than like Dodoko Tales and like Solar Pearl maybe. If nothing else, you can give her Witsith and pretend that you're a Mona main in order to cope with the fact that you still haven't gotten Mona yet for the past year. Hopefully Mihoyo gives you Mona Let's a dedicated Mona rate up in the upcoming Mondstadt event like they did for Keking last year. Barbara's artifact choices can be pretty flexible, I feel like, mainly because she can work with a lot of different two-piece combos like she's at KFC. Too bad she wasn't including the whole KFC collab that China got, but that's okay. She has a swimsuit skin and Noelle doesn't, so who's the real winner here? Two-piece Maidens, Ocean Hue, Tenacity, and Emblem are all viable options on her, so pick and choose which ones you like to either further complement your own Barb stats or bolster some stats for her that she's lacking in. You can even give her 4-piece Noblesse in case there isn't already someone else with that set on her team for some added support. For DPS artifacts though, 4-piece Heart is her most consistent. 4-piece Shimanawa is technically the stronger version, but you better have some good ER substats on that shit so that she can still get her ult on a regular basis, especially if she She's still meant to be the healer on her team too. Four Piece Wanderers is great on a reaction based barb, and if four piece sets are too annoying to farm, then just two piece heart along with a two piece attack set of your choice is fine too. Four Star Pyro Archon.
Again, I could end it there, but then all the Bennett mains in the game would tell me to go kill myself like people do to Genshin fan artists and voice actors on a daily basis on Twitter, and I'd rather not deal with that since unlike Amber mains, every Genshin player who has Bennett is a Bennett main, whether they realize it or not. He's a pyro support saber, and what does he support? He supports nuking the fuck out of your enemies until you're convinced you're playing Fallout instead of Genshin Impact. He's the gold standard for damage support, and elevates everyone on his team to god status the moment you press Q with him. This is why, in basically every Genshin video that involves big numbers, you see this guy on the teams they use. Mr. Worldwide's skill is a quick slash that he does with the sword that's Pyro. You can hold it for a level 2 and level 3 charge, where it does different shit depending on how long you charge it for. Never uses charge skills, they're a waste of time, unless your name is Alira and you make Bennett kill himself with it just to get spooked by Keking. Benny's ult is his bread and butter. He jumps up a bit and pounds the ground like a certain time-traveling detective whose name I can't mention or else I'll get cancelled by the CCP. When he ground pounds, he puts down a sizable field that heals your active character. The healing is constant so long as the field is up, but your character needs to be within the field to get the healing. Once your character is above 70%, the ult stops healing them and instead gives them a significant attack buff so long as they stay above that 70% threshold. It also constantly imbues your active character with pyro while they're inside the field as an elemental cleanse, most useful to get rid of cryo debuffs, especially when you're trying to farm that annoying fucking monster talent book domain. There are three ways to play Ben 10. Uh, the numbers don't really add up, I know, just run with the joke for now. DPS, Hybrid, and Support. DPS Bennett is a reaction-based playstyle, mainly focusing on Melt or Vape teams where he spams his E as much as possible, especially if you want to run him on the unconventional, but apparently very potent 4-piece Thundering Fury set, mainly to beat the shit out of those Electro Lectors in Abyss. Hybrid Bennett is basically pure support Bennett, but with offensive stats on his artifacts instead, so you can get some more damage out of him, considering you'll be spamming his ult as much as possible, and support Bennett, who doesn't give a fuck about stats except for HP, ER, and how much base attack his sword has, and ground pounds all day like the Chad that he is. And in case this wasn't drilled into your smooth brain by the rest of the community already, don't see six your Bennett unless you know what you're doing, or you truly have no fucks left to give since you're wasting your life playing Genshin Impact. His weapon choices are interesting, because Bennett's two most relevant stats are energy recharge and his own base attack, ER to maximize his ult uptime, and his base attack to maximize the damage buff that his ult gives. Base attack is just Bennett's own attack stat plus whatever attack stat that his weapon has, or in other words, the white number on the left when you check his stat page. If you get fucked out of good ER substats, consider running in with some ER swords like Sack or Favonius. Probably Sack, since if you couldn't get good ER substats, what are the chance that you got decent crit rate stats on him instead. If you can get him good enough ER, then give him the highest base attack sword that you have, like Akala Favonia, Miss Splitter, or Alley Flash, despite the fact that Bennett might not always benefit from their main stats. His artifacts are also heavily dependent on his playstyle. DPS Bennett takes 4-piece Crimson, or 4-piece Thundering Fury that I mentioned before. Hybrid Bennett would prefer 4-piece Noblesse or Emblem, but still works fine with the more offensive artifact sets too, and obviously support Bennett mainly wants 4-piece Noblesse for the additional damage support, otherwise he'll take pieces from sets that give him more HP or ER. 5 star pyro DPS Claymore. He's one of the 5 permanent characters you can get when you roll either any of the limited character banners when you lose the coin flip and feel depressed or wanderlust invocation. But hey, at least it's D Luke, you could have gotten spooked by Chi Chi instead. Big D's skill is a Rekka, for those of you unfamiliar with fighting games cause before Genshin y'all were playing shit like Fortnite and Candy Crush, a Rekka is a move that you can do multiple times in a row with the same input, usually up to 3 times. The first hit comes out fast, but is the weakest, the second hit comes out with about the same speed with a little more power, and the third hit is the slowest but also the strongest. If you do only one or two Rekkas but you don't use the rest, the skill will automatically enter cooldown and lock you out of using the other hits. His ult launches a big ol' fire burb that for some reason runs a fried chicken joint that definitely isn't KFC in its free time and threatens to put your ass in a usual room in German if you're not careful. D Luke throws out the Phoenix in a straight line towards wherever he's locked onto, and the Phoenix travels a certain distance forward before detonating. 
That ending blast is also important because the Phoenix will drag enemies that it hits along with it as it travels forward. So if they're still alive by the time the ult blows up, they'll take even more damage at the end. Light enemies are the most susceptible to this. The ult can also drag bigger enemies a little bit, like the Axe Hilly Trolls, but usually they're too heavy to get dragged all the way to the end when the Phoenix blows up. And after he's used his ult, Diluc gains a Pyro Infusion on his normal attacks for a short time. Genshin Batman is a very straightforward character because literally every Everything about his kit is about him doing damage, which is what happens to Genshin Fujoshi whenever they see D Luke and KF fan art. Honestly, the most complicated part of D Luke's kit is figuring out what support you want to give him, which is a great perk to have if you enjoy the lifestyle of a Giga Chad Pyromane, or just run him with Jean if you're not a Fujoshi and call it a day. Because his Rekka gives you a bit of time in between the individual hits, ideally you should throw in up to two auto attacks between his Rekkas to increase his damage output. His Blessing of Phoenix passive emphasizes the a little more as it gives him extra pyro damage and remember that his ult infuses normal attacks with pyro after it's used. Since he's a DPS claymore user, Wolf's Gravestone is by default his best option. However, Redhorn has an absurd crit damage main stat that can give Diluc better damage output than even Wolf's Gravestone can depending on how many attack buffs he gets from his team even despite the fact that its passive is basically useless on him. If you don't have any of the more whale options then the free to play claymores like the Finana Sword, Prototype Archaic, or even Debate Bait Club are perfectly fine on him. Honestly, D Luke does so much frickin' damage that he can make any claymore that's even remotely DPS related work as long as it's not just physical damage, I guess. The same simplicity applies to his artifacts too. Four piece crimson is his go to, but if you're like 80% of the Genshin player base and you can't find good crimson pieces to save your life, then two piece crimson and either two piece attack set or wanderers should still be good enough. Four piece gladiators is also good too in case you find yourself with a lot of good gladiator pieces instead. Four star cryo support archer. A cat is fine too. If D Luke is big D, then Diona is small D. She shoots off paw shaped cryo arrows with her skill, and the amount differs depending on tap or hold. Tapping the skill fires two paws and is very fast, while holding the skill shoots five but is considerably slower. She also gains a custom cryo shield that lasts longer the more paws that hit enemies that persists with your active character, just like any other shield. Diana is one of the only characters who can even create a shield on demand, and by extension, the only shield archer in the game. The shield isn't the only that she's got going for her. She also kicks a bottle of Bud Light towards enemies for her ult that puts down a cryo field and damages enemies inside it because of how bad American piss water is. The size of Diana's ult is slightly smaller than Benny's ult. In fact, their two ults are quite similar actually. They're both area of effect fields that heal your active character when they're in it, but while Benny ult stops healing after 70% HP, Diana doesn't have that restriction. So, uh, clearly Diana's ult is better, right? While not as ubiquitous as a support as Bennett is, Diana is still a very strong support archer. While she mostly lacks Benny's huge damage buffs, she makes up for it by being cryo, considering how many strong cryo characters exist in this game, and how cryo resonance is a thing for all of them. And since Diana wants ER because she's got an 80 cost ult, she can also act as a cryo battery for them too, especially if she's running a sack bow. And don't forget her shielding capabilities as a cryo archer. Putting it this way, she's kinda like Shenha before Shenha, except she's not gonna exercise your wallet or your bank account. Playing her is fairly simple too, since all you really do with her is press Q, then hold E twice if she's got Sackbo, and then switch to your other cryo character something. Of note, holding her skill is almost always better than tapping it since her shield has a pathetic uptime if you only tap it, and since her shield is such an integral part of her kit, if you're not using it to its fullest potential, you might as well just stick to Boken Boy. There aren't too many support bows out there, so Diana's got a limited arsenal, but thankfully they should be quite common at this point. Her two best bows are a Sack and Favonius, similar deal with Benny's weapons, they can mostly be up to personal preference. However, I'd make a stronger argument for Sack bow for Diana in this case, because the cooldown on her hold skill is actually quite long, so being able to instantly reset it from time to time, and the extra energy you get out of it is really nice. She can also run Elegy in case you absolutely refuse to use Red Pomu, I just think that Sack bow is just 
just too perfect of a weapon for a dino to give up using for anything else for now, but it's still a strong option in case you want to give your own Ice Cat as much support capability as you can get. Four Piece Noblesse is probably her most widely used artifact set since it gives her ult some damage support, which is the only thing that it's lacking from a support perspective. Since she scales with HP and her ult cost is 80 though, she'll also take Two Piece Emblem and Two Piece Tenacity. If you're running an HP circlet on her and you'd like some extra healing on her, consider giving her Two Piece Maidens or Two Piece, what is it, Ocean Hue to help out with that. 5-star Cryo DPS Claymore, except she doesn't give a shit about cryo damage. Eula is the queen of physical damage in a game where most people develop a gag reflex whenever they see a physical damage cup while farming artifacts, which actually isn't as bad as it sounds considering she's capable of doing things like this. She is also the queen of thighs, which explains why Amber stalks her in her free time. Now imagine getting your face sandwiched in between both of their- End user license agreement also has a tap and hold version of her skill. Tapping it makes her hit once with cryo and gives her a grim heart stack, which buffs her interruption resist and defense per stack, and she can hold up it too. Holding this skill makes her do a slower but stronger cryo hit, but it's not the cryo damage you care about. If Eula's got two grim heart stacks, her roiling rhyme passive follows up the hold skill with a big AoE physical blast. Doing this consumes the grim heart stacks, and when they get used, the grim hearts also debuff the physical and cryo resist of surround enemies, and they get converted into additional cryo damage to the surrounding enemies when Eula hits them. Note that this happens before the passive activates, giving the follow-up physical blast even more damage. Misaka's ult is a big fucking railgun that she fires using a 500 yen coin, uh, sorry, wrong franchise. Her ult is basically a big dick version of her skill, both in terms of the cryo slash that she does and the big physical blast that comes after. And unlike most other ults in Genshin Impact, it's actually got some technicality to it. After Eula ults, she creates a Lightfall Sword. It hangs out for 7 seconds behind her, following her around wherever she goes. And the longer that it's active, the more of it that you can see since it fills downwards, I guess? before exploding and dealing hella physical damage. Basically, anything Eula does that deals damage will give the Lightfall Sword an energy stack, and the more stacks that it gets, the more damage it does, pretty simple. However, the technicality with her ult is executing as optimal combos as you can get with Eula to make her ult do max damage, which actually does take some practice to execute properly. Congratulations, you now have an idea of what fighting games are like. Now good luck with DP inputs, pretzel motions, one frame links, Korean backdashes, and red parries. One last thing to point out with her ult, if you switch to another character from Eula while her Lightfall Sword is still going, the sword will instantly explode. Since on its own, the Lightfall Sword does still have good base damage, you can actually insta-bomb enemies to kill them faster if you know that giving it extra stacks is gonna be a little overkill. Naturally then, Eula is a dedicated DPS who doesn't know what the phrase sub-DPS means, or why you would put any other DPS on the same team as her. Make no mistake, when you put her on your team, you are building a team around her like the absolute queen that she is. Start off by hitting enemies with Eula's tap skill. Once she's got two grim hearts and her ult is ready, set up buffs for her from her teammates, then go ham. Remember that she has an 80 cost ult and she can't charge up on her own very fast, so running her with a cryo support is highly recommended both for their support and their cryo resonance. Also consider running an electro teammate since superconduct reactions also lower enemy physical resist too. Song of Broken Pines is her signature weapon and it's basically tailor made for physical damage based claymore users which is basically just her, Razor, and Shinyan if you'll bother using her at all. Alternatives include Wolf's Gravestone or Redhorn for the same reason that they're good on D-Loop from earlier. Since she's a DPS Claymore, she's got a lot of options for weapons even if you don't have the 5 stars because you're not an idiot who wastes money on PNGs because you're a bigger dumbass wasting it on NFTs instead. Special mention goes to the Skyrider Greatsword, which is a great 3-star weapon to have that synergizes perfectly with Eula, assuming you didn't get rid of all your copies on accident because you didn't realize that you can't roll it from Gotcha. Don't ask me how I found that out. Four Piece Pale Flame is her optimal artifact set. If you can't be asked to farm that shit because it gives you flashbacks to your experience farming Crimson Witch pieces, then you can just rock Two Piece Pale Flame and Two Piece Bloodstained. Two Piece sets from either of the attack sets are fine too if you don't feel like your Pale Flame or Bloodstained pieces are quite up to par. 4-star Electro DPS Archer. Basically, Takanashi Rika, if she were German or Austrian, depending on who you ask, wore her eye patch on her other eye and had a pet burb that's constantly sick and tired of her weeb bullshit. 
Speaking of the burb, he's Fish's skill and acts as a turret. When you tap it, she summons Ozzy Osbourne to barf heavy metal at enemies within range. The initial summoning itself also deals damage in a small AoE, before Oz starts blasting like his name is Danny DeVito. For some reason, Fish also has a hold version of her skill where she can specify where she summons Oz in case you want him to be in a particular spot. I say for some reason because this isn't actually a thing that people do unless you're trying to do some weird, like, uh, overworld puzzle or quest or something? I don't know. What is a thing is that Fish can resummon Oz if you hit her skill again while he's still active. This summons Oz instantly over to Fish's current position, allowing her to reposition Oz around the field so that he can stay in range of enemies. Her ult turns her into a furry for a bit by making her do the fusion dance with Oz, though I'm not sure how much he likes that either. While in her burb form, Fish gets greatly increased movement speed and is always on the move, as in you can't physically stand in place while the ult is active. And whenever she gets close enough to enemies, she hits them individually with lightning strikes. Once her experience as a Falco main is done, Fish turns human again and leaves Oz behind as though she used her skill, and Oz behaves the same as if he were summoned by skill too. If the burb was already deployed when Fish ults, then his duration is reset when the ult ends, and he'll teleport over to wherever the ult ended. You can also prematurely end the ult by switching over to another character in case there aren't a lot of enemies to hit. Her skill and her ult are her bread and butter, as Oz is basically free damage with a single button press. Not only that, but she also has a theoretical infinite uptime with Oz if you can recharge her ult fast enough. So, optimal off-field official play involves having the burb up for as long as possible, preferably for as long as a battle will take you if you have good enough recharge on fish and good rotations. This makes her one of the best off-field DPS characters with minimal investment, and playing her is as easy as pressing E and Q. Literally. All this talk of the burb, and we haven't even mentioned her role as an archer yet. For as strong as Oz is, Finana can also be one dangerous fish herself if you put some resources into her that aren't wireless eggs. However, you should try to get her to C1 at least, since it raises her personal damage ceiling by quite a lot, if investing into an on-field DPS fishel is what you want to do. DPS fish is also a little more technical, since you're also spamming left clicks along with E and Q with her. So difficult, I know. For some actual technicality though, practice tapping R twice after every third or fifth official auto attack. This increases her damage output slightly by reducing the pauses in her auto combo sequences since aimed shots with archers can animation cancel. Since both of her roles are DPS related, the majority of her viable weapons carry over from one to the other. Another reason to add to their laundry list of why she's so easy to use. Bows like Skyward Harp, Polar Star, Amos Bow, and Thundering Pulse are the best examples. Other bows like Viridescent, Prototype Crescent, and Slingshot will do if you're poor. For maximum drip, run fish with waltz. Some bows help fish focus more on her own damage output like Rust, Black Cliff, or a compound bow, while others help her chuck Oz out onto the field better like Elegy, Stringless, or Windbloom, so pick the best one for the role you want to give your own weeaboo German girl. Attack artifact sets are also universal for Fischl with slight deviations with Thundering Fury depending on if you want to buff Oz's damage over Fischl herself. If you want to go for more of her own personal damage though, you'll want to transition to 4-piece Pale Flame or 2-piece Pale Flame with 2-piece Black stain instead, just like Eula from before. 5-star Onimo Hybrid Saber, the second of the five permanent 5-star characters and the token Saber clone of Genshin Impact. Which is funny, seeing that Chiwa Saito voices her and not Kawasumi Ayako, though she does voice another character in this game who we'll get to in like an hour or something, it'll be a while. Jean skills straight up yeets bitches. Specifically, she can launch lightweight enemies and toss them around like Battlefield 2042 ragdolls. Some of the bigger enemies like the big hilly churls can't get tossed, but it can stagger them instead, especially if skills reacting with another element on them. Holding the skill allows Levi's to give light enemies nearby the big suck. Once they get dragged in close enough, the skill then holds them up into the air like they're getting force choked so that Jean can easily yeet them in whatever direction she wants. Doing this costs stamina though, and she can only hold it for a short period of time before she automatically yeets them. If she runs out of stamina holding her skill, then she'll also automatically yeet them. One thing to note about Everlane, her hold skill also lets you control exactly which direction you want to yeet bitches in. This includes straight up, 
which forces enemies to take fall damage and they come back down. Since fall damage in Genshin is based on max HP and not fixed damage values for both your own characters and enemies, it's one of the easiest ways to cheese high health enemies, especially in Abyss, and Jean is the best character in the game at abusing fall damage. Reformation's ult is also another field ult, like Benny's and Diona's, that also deals AoE damage and heals your characters, with one major upgrade. It also instantly heals your entire party upon activation, on top of providing HP regen and elemental cleanse for your active character while they're inside the field. Did I say this ult can literally do everything? Because it literally does everything. Eh, except for damage boosting the fuck out of your active character, and that's still Benny's job, but it does everything else besides that. Oh, and in case you didn't notice that she and Barbara are sisters yet, now you do. As I described her earlier, Redun is a hybrid character, and that she can function both as a DPS and a support at the same time, in a game where the majority of characters in it can only operate in one part of the spectrum depending on how they're geared and played. This is possible because Jean scales off attack, since her ult's heals are affected by that. Granted, she does perform a lot better in support roles since her auto combo isn't that great, and her ult isn't supposed to be used for its damage, but she's always a good supplement to your DPS's just because of her skill. When your DPS characters are on cooldown with their skills and ults, and you need damage fast, you can get in there and yeet them with Jean, assuming they can get tossed, of course. She also has a unique charge attack among sabers in Genshin Impact, an uppercut that knocks an enemy up into the air and suspends them there for a couple seconds as they slowly descend back down. Enemies that are hit by this are unable to act until they're hit out of it or they come back down. Only lightweight enemies are affected by this though, so don't go trying this on a Ruin Guard or enemies of similar size, cause... Well, you can figure that out for yourself. And if you reject Eulith ideology and you would rather embrace Apple Bottom Gene supremacy, you can certainly build her as a primary DPS anyway because fuck the meta, all my homies hate the meta. Said no Genshin player ever. Jade Cutter and Miss Splitter are solid options for both a damage and support Gene, as you might expect since they're both busted as fuck. You can also use one of the god knows how many Akala Favonia spooks you have on her too, since a lot of a DPS Gene's damage is physical unless you're running a damage infusion team with Big Chungus or Ben Stiller. If you don't have any of these and you don't do the battle pass, then have fun running your gene with like prototype Rancor or Flute or something. Support Jean usually has a lot more accessible options, since energy recharge swords should be pretty common. Don't tell me you've never rolled a copy of Sack or Favonius unless you just started the game two days ago. In fact, my blatant bias towards the sacrificial set continues here, since AYR can abuse fall damage with it even harder whenever a skill gets instantly reset. Run physical artifact sets or four-piece gladiator on a DPS-focused Jean. If you want more overlap with the support stuff, choose a two-piece attack set instead. Support Jean Jean's best artifact set is 4-piece Viridescent since it provides a big chunk of her DPS as a hybrid character, but you can also run her with 4-piece Noblesse, other 2-piece attack sets, 2-piece Emblem, or even 4-piece Ocean Hue if for some obscure reason you're curious to know what it's like being a Kokomi main. 4-star Cryo Carry. The second 4-star the game starts you off with after Amber and the most useful out of the three 4-stars you get for free. Speaking of Amber, Kea may or may not be her boyfriend, depending on if your name is Nyancha or not. Robin Hood's skill is a short-range Cryo Blast that he throws out in front of him in the direction of whatever enemy he's locked onto. It's AoE, so it'll also hit whoever else is in his way. You can also use it to freeze water in the overworld, and I think the freeze duration is the longest out of any Cryo ability in the game, so that way you can use Kea to ice bridge away to places that are isolated by bodies of water. His ult is equally as simple. K's jeweler summons three icicles around him as orbitals that deal cryo damage to any enemy that they come into contact with, and they persist with your active character. There's not much to discuss with the skill and ult since neither of them are mechanically complex, but Kea is the definition of simple yet powerful in Genshin Impact, which is the nice way of calling him an E and Q bot if you're running him as a support. Kea lives and dies by his ult since it's an orbital that constantly applies cryo, and so is teammates can use that to set up elemental reactions, and he can spam it easily with some help thanks to its 60 cost. The spammability and the orbital nature of his ult is what gives him much of his versatility as a cryo who can straddle every portion of the support to DPS spectrum. If you have Big Chungus, you can run him along with Kea and a Hydro Applicator, preferably Hydro Virgil, but Bar Bra can do the job too, and have Kea play as a cryo DPS, better if he's C1 for the extra crit rate with his autos and charge attacks. He can also be used as a physical DPS, 
Yes, in case Eula wasn't enough of a physical-based cryo character already, though he is undoubtedly much easier to use and set up than his fellow commanding officer. That, and there's the whole, you know, free 4-star versus a limited 5-star character thing going on, so yeah. But unless you're a Chaos stan and you're too busy listening to Map of the Soul, you'll mainly be using him as an ult support whose main job is to apply cryo for the team so that he can be the very best EQ quick swap bot that he can be. As usual, Miss Splitter and Jade Cutter can be used regardless of his playstyle, but surprisingly, Summit Shaper is a solid secondary whale option for Kool-Aid Man if you're interested in playing him as a DPS, either physical or cryo. Who the hell else is going to use Summit Shaper anyway on your roster? And physical swords for a physical Kea, naturally. Support Kea has probably the widest selection of viable weapons due to the versatility of his ult, so you can build him for more damage, energy recharge, or elemental mastery based on his own stats after artifacts or based on his team, so you can straight up toss him a sword just for its main stat and call it a day. Artifact sets are also similarly straightforward, at least for his DPS roles. 4-piece Blizzard, some combination of 2-piece Blizzard with a 2-piece attack or no bless set, or 4-piece Gladiator for cryo DPS. 2-piece Pale Flame and 2-piece Bloodstained or other 2-piece attack sets for physical. Note that Kea isn't the best with 4-piece Pale Flame since his skill isn't the best at triggering the 4-piece effect, and 4-piece Emblem for support followed by some combination of 2-piece Blizzard, 2-piece Noblesse, or 2-piece Emblem. Special mention goes to 4-piece Instructor for being his best budget artifact set as a support. 5 star pyro DPS caster. Who the fuck taught a lolly how to make and use bombs? Oh right, her mom did. Is her name Sarah Connor by any chance? And is Albedo just an isekai Arnold Schwarzenegger? Terrorist Lolly doesn't believe in reading kids' books, and prefers chucking Humpty Dumpty to watch him explode over and over. This is her skill, by the way. She can stock up to two of these big bombs at any time, and when she throws one it bounces three times, before splitting into a shit ton of smaller bombs that also explode after a set period of time or if they come into contact with enemies. Considering I described Albedo's ult earlier as a cluster grenade, Klee probably learned how to make cluster grenades of her own from him. The smaller mines that come out of the initial jumpy dumpty explosions are affected by Anemo, as in they can get pulled in with certain Anemo moves like Jean's E or Sucrose's E. Famously, Venti's ult does not suck in the mines for some bizarre reason, seeing that it's a fucking black hole that he's shooting, but Mihoyo probably thought that it'd be pretty broken if you could combine them, but, uh, Ayaka? Yeah, nah, she's fine. Goyo's daughter pulls out a big fucking explosion rune out of thin air for her ult, and for its duration, it tracks nearby enemies and blasts them repeatedly with LASER BEAMS! <laughs> I'm sure it was difficult to figure this out with all the time I spent talking about how much Klee loves bombing the shit out of people, but Klee is a dedicated DPS. Just don't have her in your party when you need to go fishing, otherwise she won't stop blast fishing until all the fish and Mondstadt are extinct. As hilarious as her combat is and how fun she is to play, Klee has infamously short range that more or less forces her to play like a melee character more so than a proper catalyst user. Not that that means much since you'll be in melee range against most enemies in the game whether you mean to or not. This is because her attacks are projectiles, I mean she is throwing bombs after all, but she doesn't throw them very far for both her normal attacks and her skill. I mean she's just a kid, what'd you expect? So she has to play up close to enemies and put herself in harm's way constantly to blow bitches up. What makes this worse is her propensity to rely on charge attacks, in part because she has a passive that kind of incentivizes you to use it. Her charge attack is really strong, don't get me wrong, but caster charge attacks are the most expensive of their kind in the game at 50 stamina. So unless you're always paying attention to whether or not Klee has an explosive spark on her before you charge attack with her, you'll frequently find yourself running out of stamina with your very own bomber girl. Stamina that you need to kind of have, you know, Klee iframe her way out of danger when she needs to. So you need either godlike Osu worthy, oh my god, is that the real SKT faker levels of control to make sure Klee doesn't get blown up harder than her own bombs do, or do what most normal people do and just bring a shielder and it's probably going to be Zhongli. Chuck all her bombs bombs, throw out a charge attack, put up a shield, and press Q to watch the whole world get torched by an elf lolly who's sick and tired of getting thrown into rehab. Kinda reminds me of another half-elf who's known for setting forests on fire or something. Yes, there is a walk cancelling technique that you can do to maximize Klee's normal attack DPS when she's out of jumpy dumpties to throw, but unless you're still stuck in Mondstadt or you're fighting one of the Regis Vines or the Geo Hypostasis or something, enemies aren't just gonna be standing around one place to take all the bombs Klee's throwing at them to the face. Lastly, Klee has a passive that marks all collectible materials unique to Mondstadt on your minimap, so you'll be 
bringing the bomb lolly along a lot if you're working on ascending any of the Mondstadt characters for the most part. Any of the 5 star catalysts out right now are good on Klee, yes even Memory of Dust, seeing that it's probably in your best interest to run her with a shielder not named Mash Cure Light, she'll unironically put its passive to good use. Don't worry about Moonglow, you didn't even roll for that shit anyway. Dodoko Tales is a cheaper and perfectly viable alternative if you're a Chad who prefers matching aesthetics and not a virgin who jerks themselves off over meta. If you didn't play the summer event last year, then Solar Pearl from BP, Witsith, Blackcliff Agate if you like wasting your star glitter, or Map of Mare if you're truly desperate are some alternatives to that. 4 Piece Lava Walker is actually not a meme on Klee when she uses it since Klee is always setting people on fire anyway, like that one girl in that one meme. So it's not a bad consolation prize if you keep getting shit crimson pieces because Alice hates your fucking guts. 4 Piece Crimson or Wanderers are also good, but ideally you run Klee in vape teams to make the most out of those sets. And if you just want to keep things simple, then 2 Piece Crimson and 2 Piece Noblesse. And don't be alarmed if your Klee suddenly starts chirping like a bird and calls you an idiot sandwich. That's just what she's like in another game. 4-star Electro Off-Field Caster. She's the third and the last of the three 4-stars that the game gives you when you're going through the first couple of Mondstadt Archon quests, and her voice actress is all you need to know when it comes to Lisa's character. Lisa Lisa's tap skill is a tracking electro orb that zaps the closest enemy and others around it in a small AoE. It also applies a conductive stack onto all enemies that it hits, max 3 stacks. And yes, that was a motherfucking JoJo reference, now get over yourselves JoJo fans. Her hold skill is another beast entirely. When she starts holding it, she creates a field outlined in a circle around her, and a smaller circle that expands outwards towards the outer circle with her in the center. The instant the smaller circle reaches the circumference of the outer layer, Lisa can let go of her skill, and every enemy within the field gets zapped even harder, and more so the more conductive stacks they have. If Lisa lets go at any point before her hold skill is fully charged, she'll just do a tap version of her skill instead, so practice releasing her charge skill when you know exactly when to use it. Also note that her hold skill has a significantly longer cooldown time than her tap skill, which gives you time to set up more conductive stacks on other enemies if you want to go for it again. Her ult creates another field of electricity around her, this time one that constantly zaps the shit out of enemies within its AoE. Unfortunately, it also pushes them out of its own AoE, so it can't keep doing damage to them on its own. More importantly, this means that it's not as convenient of an electro applicator as it could be, though you can remedy this by using anemo moves that give the suck better than your favorite trap does. Lisa is more difficult to play compared to other characters because her conductive mechanic requires a more active playstyle if you want to run her as a DPS. Get used to mashing your E button harder than Bennett mains do. Her aftershock passive lets her charge attacks also apply conductive, so use them sparingly if you need to. You probably won't have the luxury of putting max conductive stacks onto everyone, so you'll need to make judgment calls on when's a good time to let your hold skill rip. Speaking of her hold skill, it takes a noticeably long time to fully charge it, and during this time, obviously Lisa can't move or defend herself, so just like Klee from before, consider bringing a shielder teammate to give her another layer of defense while she gets her skill going. If you don't also have teammates who can CC, try to reserve Lisa's ult for bigger enemies that don't suffer knockback. Using against lightweight enemies is kind of a waste since they don't get zapped for the ult's full duration most of the time. It should come as no surprise then that Lisa uses basically the same weapon options as Klee does, even Memory of Dust. But since she can also spec into Elemental Mastery, she'll need Sack Frags, Favonius Codex, or Mappa Mare. If you find yourself using Lisa more like a support, you can even give her Thrilling Tales if you don't mind sacrificing her own personal damage. Kagura's Verity also happens to work well enough with Lisa with how its passive works, likely because Miko taught her how to use it because they're both Electro Catalyst users. So, if you main Lisa because your fetish is hot older women with big old titties, then consider getting scammed by Weapon Banner when it's available. Thundering Fury and standard attack sets are the go-to for Lisa. Four-piece Thunder Soother is also not bad on her either for similar reasons to a four-piece Lava Walker build on Klee, except unfortunately Lisa can't abuse four-piece Thunder Soother as hard, so something like two-piece Thundering Fury and two-piece attack set is generally going to be better. Give her Wanderers or Instructors for an Elemental Mastery build, and consider Noblesse and Emblem pieces for a support or off-field DPS build instead.
5 star hydro DPS caster, mainly a burst DPS but can be a dedicated DPS too with the right gear. She's the third permanent 5 star and a lifetime member of r slash hydro homies and she'd like to give you a daily reminder that high fructose corn syrup is a sin against humanity. Chica's skill is, appropriately, a taunt that she puts down in front of herself. While it's active, other than taunting enemies around it, it'll give off pulses that both damage and apply hydro, and when its duration is up, it explodes and deals some more AoE hydro damage. The skill also has a tap and a hold version, surprise surprise. The hold version makes Mona slide backwards a bit, presumably to get her out of harm's way while casting. Never do the hold version, you can literally do the same thing yourself by tapping E and jump cancelling in any direction you want, and that's a hell of a lot faster. She also has a miniature version of her skill that she uses automatically if she dashes around with enemies nearby, which has about the same level of usefulness as Yoimiya's charge attacks, only she have Mona at C6, which is definitely not most of you. Speaking of her dash, she has a special one that lets her burrow into the ground like a zergling, except she turns into water to do it like her name's Bruce Lee. This dash still has iframes like a normal dash and costs less stamina, but the travel distance is shorter and is more awkward to handle than a regular dash, especially in combat. Its best use by far is to travel short distances over water since it's much faster than swimming or teleporting to the nearest boat spawn. Mona also lives and dies by her ult. She casts a debuff field that'll immobilize any lightweight enemy and then eventually deals massive damage to all enemies that it hits. Think of it like a time bomb that Mona is setting on everyone within her range, and you can set it off manually and deal extra damage with whatever attack you use to set it off in the process. The AoE isn't as big as the game describes it having. It does have a pretty good range, but if you want to make every alt count, you do need to make sure to corral as many enemies as you can into one area before dropping your 25 kill streak nuke that you got with Harriers and a chopper gunner. The beauty behind this ult is the fact that Arona can spam it as many times you can spam head pets on her whenever you go to your mission menu thanks to its 60 cost. She also scales with energy recharge and even has a passive that gives her a hydro damage rebate based on how much ER she has, so if she's built properly, the only thing that should be stopping you from machine gunning her ult is its own cooldown. Combine this spam ability with some big dick attacks from your teammates and you have easy access to big damage that lets Mona slap bitches harder than she beats the shit out of Ishigami, making her nuka roll her best one and the most effective for players willing to put some resources into her, which includes Philonemo mushrooms for some reason. Uh, you might want to ask Mona what exactly she's doing with those. If you don't have the resources to invest into her, or you don't want to, and you still want to get some use out of her, she's most easily run as a free support with other cryo characters, preferably Ganyu, but she can still work with others like Rosaria or anyone else who provides consistent cryo application. DPS Mona is pretty expensive in comparison because ideally you'd want her at C2, and again, unless you're an idiot like me who burns Benjamins on what's essentially a Chinese NFT, or you're incredibly lucky, or unlucky depending on who you ask, you probably don't have her at C2. But if you insist on running your own Shamiko as a DPS anyway because waifu power, first of all, turn yourself into your nearest police station immediately. Second of all, any of the 5 star catalysts except for, obviously, Moon Glow will work. Kagura's Verity, not so much because Mona can't make use of its passive, but it's still a big fucking stat stick, so missing out on the passive isn't that bad, hopefully. If you give her a crit stat catalyst, either crit rate or crit damage, give her attack buffers as well to make better use of her crits. Nuke Mona's weapon by far is Witsith, and luckily for you, it's only a 4 star, so getting extra copies of it is at least feasible even for free to plays. But don't think that you absolutely have to have Witsith to play Mona as a nuker, since DPS Mona and nuker Mona can more or less be played the exact same. Support Mona cares a lot less about her own damage since her main job is to enable freeze teams, so while she can run the same weapons as before, she can start using other cheaper options like Thrilling Tails to buff another DPS on her team, Codex, Prototype Amber, or Wine and Song, another reason why Support Mona is so much easier to run compared to DPS Mona. Roxy's best artifact set by far is Four Piece Emblem. It might have been tailor made for Raiden, but Mona loves this shit too, and can run it for every role except maybe free support, but even then she can rock it pretty well too. DPS Mona can default to 4-piece Heart of Death instead, or build 2-piece sets with Heart of Death and any other attack set, including Noblesse, or Wanderers, or even Emblem just for the extra ER. In support, Mona can run 4-piece Noblesse for some more damage support. She can run 4-piece Tenacity to set up a boosted damage window for her team, but given her skill's cooldown, it's not exactly ideal. 
4 star Geo Flex Claymore. You can get a guaranteed copy of her with a beginner banner at the start of the game, unless you're greedy or you're re-rolling or both and don't plan to roll it at all. Noelle puts a shield around herself for her skill and for your active character if you switch off her. The shield's appearance is unique so that you know it's her shield in case you have multiple layers up. Its activation does damage and its health scales with defense, so the more defense stats she has, the more damage it'll tank before breaking. Also, while it's active, the shield grants her normal and charge attacks basically a 50-50 the chance to heal the whole team, and the amount of HP she regens like this also scales off her defense. Noelle Zolt is the Claymore version of Genocide Cutter. On initial activation, she turns her sword into a big fucking sword that Doom Guy would be proud of, and throws out a big swing. After that first swing, her normal and charge attacks do geo damage for a short period of time, and get ludicrously bigger range to the point where your normals start covering your entire screen. They also get more damage the more defense she has, and can also heal your team if her shield is still active. Noelle is designed to be the starter character aside from the Traveler, of course. She's your early game support character who provides healing and shielding that the rest of your roster most likely can't give you unless you got lucky and rolled someone like Barbara or Benny. At the start of any fight, you immediately pop Noelle's shield, switch to someone else to do damage, and when someone gets low on HP, swap back to her, pop her shield again, and beat shit up to heal everyone up to a comfortable level before switching back to your DPSs. And when shit gets real tough, press that Q button, and go to town. Note that for optimal healing, you actually want to use Noelle's charge attack for a spin to win move. Noelle heals per hit, and charge attacks actually have a faster attack speed than her normals, so she heals the team faster this way. Claymores also provide overall utility like breaking rocks, and since she's your only Claymore user, if you didn't already roll somebody like Big Chungus or that one Chinese girl that no one uses, you'll be relying on your Noelle a lot for mining. But ultimately for most people, Noelle is the Woody of Genshin Impact. She's there to carry you through early game until you drop her for other characters who do the things that she does better than she does and in more interesting ways, just like how Tectone dropped Arknights. But if you're a Giga Chad Noel main like Lakari was back when he actually played this game, you can build her to be a rare example of a flex character who can be both a support and a DPS with a single loadout, though. Honestly, at this point, you should probably start treating her like an actual DPS who can heal the team as a nice side perk. Recent content has brought Noelle back into the spotlight, actually, which includes a weapon, Redhorn, the undisputed new best claymore that's a must for all you Noelle loyalists out there. You don't have a lot of weapon options when it comes to DPS characters who scale with defense, and Noelle's no exception, obviously, so Redhorn is an extremely welcome addition to her very limited arsenal. I mean, shit, if Redhorn is being recommended even for characters who don't scale with defense, then you know it means business. If you didn't roll for Redhorn, then stick with that copy of Skyward Pride that no one else uses, Serpent Spine if you're a Battle Pass gamer, or White Blind if you're poor. If you're still running more of a support Noel, then White Blind is still good too, though she can also run Sack Greatsword or Favonius Greatsword for some extra energy recharge, I guess. Just like Redhorn, the Husk Artifact set is also a recent and very welcome addition to Noel's limited artifact options, so it should be no surprise that Four Piece Husk is her best in slot option for both DPS and support. And in case you're still farming for good husk pieces, four piece retracing bolide or four piece gladiator can be placeholders until you get some. Or just go with two piece husk and two piece archaic. A two piece maidens can also be nice if you just want better healing instead. 4 star electro DPS Claymore. His element is a little misleading as a lot of his damage is actually physical. Also, his favorite food is hash browns, and he doesn't quite understand why y'all are trying to send a relative of his to the moon? His tap skill is a quick AoE slash in front of himself. It's not a big AoE, but it'll still hit multiple enemies if they're packed together right in front of him. It deals electro damage, and on hit, it'll give him an energy recharge boost per enemy hit. He can have up to three of these stacks, and anytime he gets a new stack, the duration of all the stacks that he has refreshes. His hold skill is a different beast altogether, sort of like Lisa's. After a pretty short cast time, Razor blasts the ground around him with electro in a slightly bigger AoE, mainly because it has a circular effect compared to the frontal AoE that his tap skill has. If he still has any of the ER stacks from his tap skill, the hold skill clears them and then converts them directly into energy for Razor himself. It can also destroy rocks in one shot, so he can actually serve as your placeholder Zhongli in case you're as broke as he is. Razor's ult, a stand. It's an enemy stand. 
is a Giga Chad Wolf who hovers over Razor and attacks alongside him whenever he does, be it his normals or skill, though his charge attacks are disabled while the ult's active. It also gives him increased attack speed, increased electro resist, increased interruption resist, elemental cleanse, and immunity to electric charge damage. Upon activation, it'll also clear any of the ER stacks that his tap skill can give him and converts them into energy just like his hold skill does. Razor can also manually end his ult by getting switched out and it'll refund him some energy back, depending on how much time it had left. Your game plan with Wolf Boy is to build up his ult as fast as possible, and the moment you get it, press Q immediately. Not only will this make Razor stronger, but it'll also imbue you with a damage boost IRL because you're stimulating your inner JoJo fanboy or fangirl. Try not to pose too hard or your parents will come into your room to tell you to lower your cringe levels. Throw in a couple skill uses here and there, alternating between tapping and holding, and that's Razor gameplay more or less in a nutshell. He's an interesting case of a character who does both elemental damage Damage and physical damage together at the same time thanks to the stand nature of his ult, so he can run either attack or physical damage claymores. Skyward Pride is also surprisingly decent because of its passive effect being considered physical damage, so as long as he's running a physical damage cup, it's not bad. The other 5 star claymores can be good too, depending on your setup. Serpent Spine and Prototype Archaic are your cheaper options, and in fact, Serpent Spine can be his best weapon that can outperform even the whale claymores under ideal circumstances even at R1, in case you're wondering which weapon to get from the battle pass. The dual nature of his damage can also influence his artifact choices, as he can run either physical damage or attack percent for his cup, though preferably physical. Electro damage is actually not what he wants since he still does most of his own damage even with his ult helping him out, unlike Bree Larson. And for sets, 4-piece Pale Flame is ideal, but substitute 2-piece Bloodstained or another attack set wherever needed, or even 4-piece Gladiator if you have better Gladiator pieces instead. 4-star Cryo Damage Support Lancer. The first spear user we're covering, Rosaria is that creepy goth girl from school who always sits at the back of the classroom and sits alone at lunch too and can speak Latin for some weird reason. Also, she's proof that someone at MiHoYo was a really big fan of Rosario Vampire back in the day. Whenever she's not listening to My Chemical Romance while she's running around in the middle of the night doing god knows what, Rosaria teleports behind an enemy and shanks him from behind for her skill. The only thing she doesn't do is tell them that it's nothing personal, though it would be in character for her if she did. Her skill is a legitimate instant transmission that makes her feel like a DBZ character and gives her great short-range mobility. Just remember that she can't teleport behind bigger enemies, she'll just end up teleporting straight towards them instead. Rosaria's ult, Punishing Edge, other than sounding like something you'd like her to do to you, summons a big-ass cryo spear and drives it into the ground towards the, where the nearest enemy is if there's one in range. You do need to be already within basically melee range for it to do its full damage though, but that shouldn't be an issue given what her skill is. Once the Cryo Spear is planted, it stays there for a bit, pulsing with Cryo that damages enemies and inflicts Cryo onto them. Rosaria's job has an additional layer that her skill and her ult don't cover. Her passives give her the rare ability to buff her team's crit rate, and yes, they do synergize with each other. So what she wants to do is target a smaller enemy if she can, tell them that it's nothing personal, and then throw her ult down or at another target then swap to another character who will benefit from the crit rate that she's just given to the team, preferably a pyro character, so you can try doing reverse melt reactions, and make Rosaria's ult do even more damage. If you're a Rosaria main because you love goth girls or vampire girls too much because your favorite Toho character is Aurelia, you can also run her as a dedicated DPS, either cryo or physical, but as we've seen with Mona from before, that usually takes more investment to pull off, and just relying on her ult damage is more efficient anyway. Being a spear user, her best weapon is naturally Staff of Homeless. It's her best in slot as a cryo DPS and as a burst support, and it's top 3 even as a physical DPS. True to her nature though, she doesn't care too much about what spear you give her since she can still work well with any of the other 5 star and even 4 star weapons too, depending on what you have. So between her cryo DPS and burst support roles, she can mostly use the same weapon options, though obviously something like Skyward Spine is more of a burst support weapon since it's got energy recharge. Add in Crescent Pike if you insist on running her as a physical DPS for some weird reason that I won't be able to understand. Like a lot of other 4-star characters in Genshin right now, her best artifact set is 4-piece emblem since it gives her the two things that she really wants, and you recharge for better ult uptime and ult damage, though this is best only for a burst support role. She can also mix and match Noblesse, Blizzard, and attack set pieces, or even opt for a more dedicated support.
support roll with 4 piece no bless. If you're feeling real spicy, you can run 4 piece Lava Walker on her if you're looking to go for some reverse melt damage. Cryo DPS Rosaria wants 4 piece Blizzard or Gladiator or some combination of Blizzard and another attack set. And Physical Rosaria takes any combination of the physical and attack sets with some more nuanced options in 4 piece Gladiator, Blizzard Strayer for the additional crit stats, or even Retracing Bolide. 4 star Animo support caster. Rosaria might be an MCR fan, but Sucrose prefers Fallout Boy, mainly because she thinks Albedo could probably be one of its members, maybe. Glucose's skill moderately pulls in enemies in an AoE. After a brief casting time, she creates an Animo updraft underneath whatever enemy she's locked onto, dealing Animo damage and sucking in other enemies that are nearby, which makes sense given the first three letters of her own name. It also launches lightweight enemies, much like how Jean can with their charge attack and skill, and it's got a decent AoE so it can hit a lot of enemies if they're bunched up together, which happens a lot thanks to its vacuum effect. Note that the vacuum effect on her skill is not insanely strong. Enemies need to already be in close proximity to each other to have the most effect, so while the skill gives her similar utility as, say, Venti's ult, you do need to be more mindful of it if you want to use her that way. She starts with only one charge of the skill, but her C1 gives her a very useful second charge that does help a lot in pulling in enemies that are further away from each other. The skill can also set up Fructose to then use her ult, which is pretty much the big dick version of her skill. She chucks an enchanted Minecraft potion filled with the bottled farts of Genshin Impact Twitter followers at the closest enemy if they're in range, and it puts out a Butterfree that creates three big Anima updrafts just like her skill, four if she's at C2, that constantly pulls in enemies, damages them once they're inside its range, and also launches them if they're lightweight. It can also absorb Hydro, Pyro, Electro, or Cryo energy and infuse itself with it to deal additional damage of that element type, but it can only do so once. Once it absorbs an element, it'll stay that element for the rest of its duration. The CC ability of her skill gives Lactose an extra layer of utility, but again, her real support capability comes from her passives, which allow her to take a portion of her own Elemental Mastery stat and boost the rest of her team's EM with it. For this reason, she's an Elemental Reaction Damage support and is best used on Reverse Vape or Reverse Melt teams or any other team that focuses on very strong Elemental Reaction Damage, and she does this by tossing out her skills after another party member's already hit enemies with their element, then throws out her ult before switching to other teammates who can then capitalize on the EM bonuses she's just given them by using her skill and ult. Being the only Animo caster in the game currently, and considering her role as an EM buffer, Sucrose has kind of limited catalyst options, but they do tend to define what her role is more so than for other characters. Sack Frags is normally her default, sure, but Thrilling Tales gives her the ability to super buff one DPS on her team, and Codex gives her a lot of ER to work with for maximum ult uptime if you prefer using her as kind of like a budget venti. 4 piece Viridescent is her best set, naturally, because she's an Anemo support. It's either that or 4 piece Instructors if you can't stand farming Viridescent domain because you get Maiden's pieces all the damn time. Don't invest into crit stats unless you're running Sucrose with Codex. I'll explain why when we talk about this next guy. 5 star Animo off field DPS Archer. Speaking of 4 piece Viridescent users, we got another one right here, the very first limited 5 star character in Genshin Impact. His favorite beer is Heineken, and his favorite wine is Etna Bianco. Venti's skill is basically a slightly slower version of Sucrose's skill. The tap version tracks the closest enemy and blasts them from underneath with an Animo current, which also launches them if they're lightweight. He also has a passive that causes them to fall slower down to the ground for some better crowd control. For the hold version, a Alpha launches himself up into the air with the same Animo updraft after a moderate casting time. He can start gliding once he's up in the air or plunge attack down right after. The tap version is what you'll use a lot more in combat. Holding it is mainly used for cheesing some exploration stuff, unless you're a big fan of plunge attacking and you're not a Zhao haver. Bridget's ult, a fucking black hole, gives all lightweight enemies on the map the big suck, just like any good trap should, and puts them in the blender while doing Animo damage to them. It also has the same trait that Sucrose's ult has of absorbing one element out of Hydro, Pyro, Cryo, and Electro to deal additional damage of that type. Ventrilo is best used in fights that involve a lot of small enemies because his ult just completely shuts down whatever they try to do, and it's only 60 cost, and his ascension stat is ER. So it is very easy to just have him spam ults all over the damn place and watch enemies die from getting sucked off too hard by a trap's black holes. Not bad for a 20 ounce plastic cup from Starbucks. His 
biggest enemy, however, is anyone who can summon additional enemies, like those annoying Sisson mages and their flies. In Genshin Impact, you can't manually target enemies because that would be a nightmare for mobile players, and we can't have that now, can we? So targeting is automatic and tracks whoever is closest to your character. So if Venti hits Q, and you want him to put his ult on one enemy, but you forget that there's a Sisson fly or something else behind you that's closer, he'll throw his ult in the fly's direction instead. And while I joked earlier that Venti's ult has infinite suck range, it really doesn't, so you'll find yourself with a half-useless ult that's nowhere near where you want it to go. So, mind your positioning a little bit, and you'll be fine. Shove his face into those Sisson Mage's tits if you need to. He's got some experience doing that to Signora, that's for sure. His weapon options are interesting. Elemental reactions cannot crit in this game, and most of Venti's damage is reaction-based because of his ult. So for him, and with Sucrose from earlier actually, you shouldn't care about crit stats at all. You can build a crit-based Venti, and technically, it would be stronger than a default reaction-based Venti, but you'd need whale levels of investment to get to that point, so don't even bother with that unless you're an idiot and you spend primo gems to refresh resin. Imagine Max refreshing resin every day in Genshin. Couldn't be me. This makes Stringless his go-to weapon. It should be a common enough 4-star bow for even free-to-plays to have access to. Remember to use the skill first before his ult, though, to get the passive effect to apply to his ult. LG trades some of Venti's own personal damage for some additional team support, which synergizes perfectly with his off field DPS role, and other options include Windbloom, Alley Hunter, or even Ravenbow if you're really poor. Same as with Sucrose, Hideyoshi just wants 4-piece Viridescent, but you can run him with 4-piece Noblesse instead for an extra layer of team support, or if you just really hate farming Viridescent pieces. That's it for the Mondstadt characters, now let's go to China. 4-star Electro DPS Claymore, though she's mainly an off-field DPS. She's Genshin's answer to Francis Drake and FGO, or any other strong, independent big booba female pirate leader archetype in other animes or games who don't need no man. Also, daily reminder to spell the first three letters of her name as B-A-E. Bay's skill has two versions, tapping it is a quick 360 slash that she does around herself that deals electro damage, but holding it creates an electro shield while Beto herself assumes a defensive posture and can't move unless she cancels the skill or follows through with it. If she gets hit while she's in her skill's defensive stance, then the follow-up slash gets more damage in range, and even more damage in range if she gets hit twice. The shield can tank a few more hits after the first two, but the slash at the end won't get powered up more beyond the second hit. You'll know you hit max damage and range if the screen darkens when you do the slash. The hold skill will also imbue Beto with Electro, acting as a self-elemental cleanse, but remember that it only cleanses Beto herself and that it only does it once, so don't just stand in the middle of an enemy cryo mist or something like that like an idiot. Her retribution passive lets her skill hit max damage and range instantly if you time it right when you take a hit, essentially acting as a parry, and it effectively gives Beto an instant counter that can do a ton of damage at the press of a button. Note that the enemy attack you parry also doesn't do damage to you if you parry correctly. Baywatch's ult, a stun gun, zaps the shit out of enemies around her every time she or whoever your active character is hits enemies with their normal or charge attacks. Her ult can zap once every second, and it can jump to other enemies if they're close enough together. At C1, her ult also gets an electro shield of its own that tanks damage like a conventional shield that lasts as long as the ult does or until it's taken enough damage and breaks. This ult is the reason why Beidou is best played as an off-field DPS. It helps enable so-called taser teams that focus on constant electro charge damage that zap enemies to death, or even fireworks teams that just blast enemies with constant elemental reactions. Ideally, you'd like to have her at C2 for the two extra zaps, but if you're poor, then well, pray that Beto gets more raid ups in the future, I guess. So Bayonetta wants to focus on charging up her ult, then use it in tandem with the rest of her team's ults for maximum effectiveness while your main DPS goes in harder than Ike Evelyn did for his first karaoke stream. But keep in mind that her skill is one of the game's only defensive options that isn't just eye framing with dashes, so don't be afraid to switch to her to put up her skill in case things get too hot. And if you get really good, you can start channeling your inner third strike and use her parry to instantly turn 
turn your defense into a good offense. You might not be the next Daigo Umehara, but at least you'll have a good idea of how to play Bloodborne. Gravestone, Redhorn, and Unforged are her best 5-star options. Scour Pride can work if you need her to have more ER, and you're running her as the only Electro character in a team. Serpent Spine is an excellent choice if you're a Battle Pass gamer, especially when you consider Beto's role as an off-field DPS, and how if you have one of those 5-star Claymores that I mentioned earlier, it's probably better off if someone else gets it so that they can put it to better use than Beto herself can. She thankfully has a lot more options like Akuo Maru, Sea Lord, Lithic Blade, Sat Greatsword, Favonius Greatsword, or Prototype Archaic. She'll take either ER for better ult uptime or attack percent for better ult damage, and there's a lot of claimer options for those two stats, so pick your favorite. Four Piece Emblem is good if you need some extra recharge from her artifacts, but since Electro Resonance is a thing, it's not as high priority as it is on other 4 star characters, so consider Two Piece Thundering Fury and a Two Piece Attack Set as an alternative. Four Piece Thunder Soother is viable on Electro Charge or Mono Electro teams, and Four Piece Noblesse if you're running a more support Beto, though it's not as good on her as it is on other dedicated support characters. <laughs> 4-star Cryo Burst Support Claymore. He learned his Naruto hand signs from his aunt and can't stop buying pints of butter peck and haagen and bomb pops. For his skill, Big Chungus slams the ground in front of him with his Claymore after doing a short hop that he's been practicing in melee, setting off a Cryo Blast and creating a Cryo Field for some time. While your active character is within this field, if they're a melee character, fittingly, or in other words they use a sword, claymore, or spear, their normal and charge attacks get infused with cryo and do cryo damage, including Chungus himself, naturally. Note that while this infusion doesn't override the elemental damage of other characters' skills or ults that are used inside a skill field, it will override other elemental infusions unless they specifically say that they're immune to elemental overrides. For example, if Kuching uses her skill within the field, her her teleport slash is still Electro, but her normal attacks afterwards will be Cryo instead of Electro. Chongqing's ult drops three big ice swords right on top of whatever enemy he's locked onto that then explode with Cryo damage. The explosion will also launch lightweight enemies. It does a fuck ton of damage thanks to its great scaling, but has no other utility which is why it's only 40 cost and very spammable. Xingqiu's bestie didn't just learn Naruto gang signs from his auntie, he also inherited the same niche from her too of being a Cryo damage support. Because of his skill's cryo infusion overriding other elements, he should really only be used to super enable the shit out of your cryo DPS. Otherwise, he'll just end up ruining the damage output of literally everyone else. So if you're not a cryo main, you'll realistically only use him as an expedition bot along with Amber. If you still insist on using him anyway, then he'll at most be just an ult bot since at least his ult is really strong, especially with a verse melt. And you'll need to be a little more picky about who his teammates are so that his skill doesn't and mess with their own kits. But if you are a cryo main, suddenly your cryo gameplay options really open up here since with Big Chungus, you can make even normal attacks do cryo damage and enable teams like Hyper DPS Kea or Omega DPS Ayaka where she doesn't need to dash as much to get her cryo infusion while she's inside Chongyun's field. Despite his cryo niche however at C2, his skill has the very rare effect of reducing the cooldown of any skill or ult by 15% regardless of element and that's worth mentioning. Chongo shares more or less the same weapon options as Beto from before, since they're both sub-DPS Claymore users, with the caveat that he doesn't need energy recharge Claymore since his ult is already very cheap anyway at only 40 energy. This being said, you can still run Sat Greatsword on him if you play him mainly as an enabler and want as much uptime on his skill field for your other cryo DPSs as you can. Same with his artifact sets too actually, like 2-piece Blizzard and another 2-piece attack set, especially Noblesse, if you want to maximize ult damage. But unlike Beido, Chongyun is also a great 4-piece no plus candidate himself because of his very low ult cost and ult cooldown, especially since he can lower it even further if he's C2. Five star cryo cheat code. She's the BFG of Genshin Impact, except unlike the BFG, she has unlimited ammo. Coco Goat's skill sets down a cryo flower on the ground where she's standing, while Ganyu herself moonwalks backwards. The initial activation deals cryo damage to enemies nearby, and the flower itself taunts them too for some extra utility before blowing up and doing more cryo damage to those enemies. It's very similar to Mona's taunt, with a couple differences, the most obvious being that Ganyu starts with two charges instead of one. For her ult, Ginyu throws up a big fucking disco ball out of nowhere and just vibes while everything around her dies from nuclear winter. 
No wonder she knows how to moonwalk. The Disco Ball drops icicles down onto enemies in a huge AoE for such a long time that it's disgustingly easy for Ganyu to have another ult ready before the first one expires, especially with its 60 cost and with another cryo battery. Her Harmony passive also makes her ult give a 20% cryo damage bonus to your active character while they're within the ult's AoE, so she can even function as a cryo damage support if you prefer using another cryo character as your main DPS. This is only one half of her kit. The the other half, as you know, is her charge attacks. Overworld Cryo Waifu has a unique two-stage charge attack, where if she charges her shot up all the way and shoots it, her arrow has a follow-up AoE attack that blooms downwards at the point of impact and deals even more damage. Basically, she's China's entire nuclear arsenal if you turned it into a waifu, and if geared out well, she literally shoots pocket nukes that just straight up delete 90% of the game's content. Cryo Amber, by the way. Because both her charge attack and ult are cracked as fuck, Ganyu has complete freedom to play however she wants, an actual archer that lets you play Genshin as a third-person shooter who spams charge shots faster than beta testers can leak upcoming content, or as an ult bot that just spams disco balls like it's the 70s all over again, or literally anywhere in between. And even if you choose to play on one side of the Ganyu cheat code spectrum or another, you can still deviate into the other side pretty comfortably even if it's not exactly optimal. So in other words, Coco Goat isn't the answer to all of Genshin's problems. No, she's the question, and the answer, by default, is yes, because her charge attacks slap enemies harder than Will Smith does at the Oscars. Uh, except for Cryo Slimes and Cryo Abyss Mages with their shields up, fuck those pieces of shit. Amos Bow is her default option since it synergizes best with her charge attacks, which is great since you're not using this on anyone else for the most part, unless you're one of those three Amber Maids I mentioned at the beginning of the video. The big stat stick bows like Polar Star, Harp, or Thundering Pulse are also great, just remember not to overstack the crit rate stats on her with Polar Star or Harp if you're running 4-piece Blizzard on your own Toriel. Hana Yumi and Prototype Crescent are the free-to-play versions of Amos Bow if you're playing Charge Attack Ganyu and Alley Hunter, Stringless, and LG are for Disco Ball Ganyu. Four Piece Blizzard is the best set on a freeze or off field DPS Mountain Goat. If you don't have enough Blizzard pieces, then opt for a two piece attack set of your choice until you can get better Blizzard pieces. Four Piece Noblesse is also nice on a full support Ganyu. Yes! 5-star Pyro DPS Lancer. No, she's not a shielder in this game, but she does have an explosion of her own. Mash Curlite's skill is an install. Not quite a dragon install, mainly since Soul doesn't have it in Strive, but somehow Kai does? But whatever, same concept. The initial activation has a small AoE that deals Pyro damage to enemies who are basically right next to her, and pushes them back a little. Afterwards, Hu Tao's normals and charge attacks do pyro damage for a short time until the install runs out. Each activation eats 30% of Hu Tao's current HP to use, which sounds bad at first, but she has a way of mitigating the damage that we'll get into soon. If you switch her out while she's still got her install, it'll end immediately, so try to get as much value out of each activation as you can, since it's, well, not exactly free. While she's powered up like this, her pyro infusion can't be overridden, she gets an additional attack bonus that scales off her max HP, and she gains resistance to enemy interruption. Her charge attacks also put blood blossoms onto enemies that they hit, one blossom per enemy at any given time, and these blossoms deal extra power damage to whoever they're on every couple of seconds as a damage over time thing until they expire on their own. Megumin's ult is a big ol' AoE pyro attack that nukes enemies around her because she got the brilliant idea of turning herself into an explosion instead. Just like what Seth said, When you run out of ammo, you become the ammo. The ult regens Hu Tao's health off of each enemy that it hits, up to 5 enemies, and if she's at or below half HP when she ults, it'll do more damage and recover more HP. Both of her passives are also worth mentioning. Her first gives the team except herself extra crit rate for a short time when her install ends like Rosaria does, so she can benefit the team even outside of her optimal damage windows. And her second gives her even more pyro damage when she's at or below half HP, which makes both her install and especially her ult do even more damage. So her gameplay loop is that you use Hu Tao's skill, go ham with it to do damage and build up her ult, then use her ult for some extra nuke damage and get back some of her health and do it all over again. She's especially powerful on vape or melt teams whenever she's not smoking the extra incense sticks that she finds after every funeral she administers because that's the closest thing to vaping in Genshin Impact. 
Naturally, her partner in crime is Ethan Klein, uh, I mean Ching Cho, but she can work with Kaya or Ganyu for melt damage too. Staff of Homeless is the funeral director's BIS, no surprise there. But what may be a surprise is that Dragon's Bane is her next go-to and the much cheaper alternative in case your luck doesn't believe in 5-star weapons. Just make sure to use her in vape teams like you're supposed to. Try not to give her attack percent based spears, she mainly gets her attack buffs from all the HP to attack conversions in her own kit, so you're much better off giving her crit spears if you have one. Four Piece Crimson is her BIS, again because she hangs out with Chinese Ethan Klein and a vape niche on a regular basis. Alternatively, she can run Four Piece Shimanawa, but you'll have to decide if it's worth sacrificing a chunk of her ult accessibility to boost her normals and charge attacks even further. Two Piece Crimson with either Two Piece Wanderers or Tenacity are fine too. Four Piece Bolide can also be good if you can provide consistent shielding for her, which Hu Tao appreciates since her HP bar is going to be fluctuating harder than the stock market, especially Especially nowadays. 5 star Electro DPS Saber. The fourth permanent 5 star, she's BFFs with Ganyu, though she isn't totally opposed to Cloud Retainer's idea of getting the two married so they can get moved into the same department together at the office or something. Risitas' skill is a short range teleport attack, kinda like Rosaria's but without the backstab mechanic. Keking first throws a stiletto knife made of Electro at the nearest enemy. The stiletto does some Electro damage in a small AoE and stays where it hit that enemy for a few seconds. Once the stiletto is out and before it expires, she can then do one of two things. She can hit E again, and she'll teleport to the position of the stiletto and do a big AoE slash. Doing this then gives her normals and charge attack and electro infusion for a bit thanks to her first passive. The second thing she can do is instead of recasting E, she can charge attack immediately, and this will detonate the stiletto in a moderate electro AoE at its location. Her ult has her full send herself and do an omni slash around herself ending with a big final hit. This last hit also launches smaller enemies if they're in range, and afterwards for a short time, thanks to her second passive, she'll get extra crit rate and ER to help her get her ult back faster. Not that she needs that much help getting back an ult that's only 40 cost anyway. Keking has two ways that she can play, the correct way and the incorrect way. The correct way is going electro DPS, the incorrect way is this. Because if you want to play a 5 star character as a physical DPS, why not just go play Eula? But hey, it's just a gacha game, so you can do whatever you want and no one's gonna judge you, I promise. A good chunk of her damage comes from her charge attack since she's got a strong one, especially when it's electro infused, but it's got two main problems. The first is that it knocks smaller enemies back, so her ideal targets are bigger enemies who have resistance to knockback so you can do charge attack loops on them for big damage. The second and bigger problem is that since she's charge attacking repeatedly, she'll drain your stamina that you need for dashes, for repositioning, or iframes. But a good way to remedy this is to ult at the end of her last charge attack. Keking is invulnerable during the entire duration of her ult until she comes back, and she'll start rebuilding stamina while the ult's still going. Or you could just bring Zhongli like usual. Kekin can get his autograph afterwards too, I guess. Alternatively, you can do the reverse and ult first for the extra crit rate and energy recharge. Double E, then go ham with charge attacks. This is probably the preferred combo anyway, especially if you don't have as high crit rate on Keking as you'd like. Zeta can also use her skill for exploration purposes since you can hold it to control where you want to send it. This hold version doesn't have much combat application since just tapping it is way faster, but it does have vertical play that can help you traverse map terrain a lot better. And no, you shouldn't be plunge attacking with this either, leave that to Zhao. Mist Splitter and Jade Cutter are her two best weapons for an Electro playstyle, naturally. Summit Shaper might be a meme to some of you, but since shielding is recommended with her to cover her tendency to drain your stamina constantly, she can put it to good use at least. Black Sword is her best 4 star weapon thanks to its passive, but you can even make Harbinger of Dawn work on her too if you're not a BP gamer. If you're okay with running an incorrect Keking, Akala Favonia becomes viable otherwise she shares a lot of the same weapon options with Electro Keking. Artifacts also differ based on playstyle. Two-Piece Thundering Fury and Two-Piece Attack set is her default since it's her generalist set that gives her balanced performance between her charge attacks and her ult. But you can replace the attack set with Two-Piece Noblesse if you feel like playing a quick swap Keking whose job is only to ult the shit out of enemies and peace the fuck out. Physical Keking wants Four-Piece Pale Flame since her double E cast will instantly activate the Four-Piece bonus. Otherwise, run the physical bonus sets or attack sets. Four-piece bolide is okay too, as long as you have a shielder like before.
4 star Geo DPS caster, currently the only Geo Catalyst user in the game, and besties with Beto, even more so than Keking and Ganyu, if you know what I mean. Geo Mommy? Sorry, Geo Mommy? Sorry, Geo Mommy? Sorry. Her skill casts a big ass screen that's an accurate representation of her own dump truck. They do say art imitates life. The initial cast does Geo damage in a small AoE directly in front of her. Unlike many skills in the game that auto-target if they don't specifically have a hold version that lets you pick exactly where you want to cast them, Ning Wong's skill doesn't auto-track for you, so you have to have proper positioning yourself. The Jade screen that she puts down acts as a flat shield that can block enemy projectiles and let your own pass through, sort of like one-way smokes in CSGO or Valorant except here in Genshin you can still fully see what the fuck you're shooting at. Note that enemies can still walk through it and their melee attacks can also still smack you through it, so it won't protect you from everything. The game treats the screen as its own entity, so it has HP that scales with Geo Mom's own max HP, meaning that it can be destroyed by enemies if they damage it enough. You can only have one screen up at any time, and you can't climb it like other Geo constructs. Ninghai's ult, the Super Shotgun, fires off about 6 or 7 gems that track the nearest enemy, though their targeting can get wonky if there are multiple enemies nearby, or if they break your lock on somehow. If she's near an active jade screen when she ults, the screen will deactivate, but it'll also shoot an extra 5 gems at nearby enemies too. Just like her best secretary, Ningguang uses charge attacks as a huge part of her kit. In fact, it's what she should be doing all the time with her. Her normals give her a star jade per hit, and she can stock up to 3. When she charge attacks, she also uses these star jades as additional ammo, and they track the nearest enemy like the gems on her ult. The star jades have much better damage scaling than her regular normals do to the point where it's actually damage optimal to use one normal, then immediately charge attack just to use that one star jade and repeat the process. Her first passive that removes the stamina cost of her charge attacks whenever she's got any number of star jades helps out with that too. This combination of her star jade mechanic and her ult gives her big geo burst damage windows, especially on single target enemies so that all the jades home in on the same enemy. Constellations are therefore very important on her. A lot of 4 star characters do benefit a lot from them, but Ningguang arguably relies on hers the most, especially her C6, which essentially lets her ult twice for the cost of one. And whenever you do ult with her, make sure to run her through her own jade screen, since her second passive gives your active character extra geo damage if they run through the screen itself, which may or may not be an innuendo. Also, run her with other attack buffers who can help fix her low damage scaling like the Pyro Archon. Any of the 5 star catalysts are usable actually. Technically you can even make use of Kagura's passive if your Ningguang is at least C2, but you should really be using it for its crit damage stat instead. You can also run her with Witsith, but you better pray that you don't get the EM buff since that shit is more useless on Geo characters than Genshin's daily login system on their website. Though, maybe some of you actually do need those extra 60 primos a month, I don't know. Mihoyo doesn't exactly hand out a lot of primo gems to begin with. If you don't have a 5 star catalyst, then Dodogo Tail, Solar Pearl, Eye of Perception, or even Frostbearer can be placeholders until you get spooked by Lost Prayer or Scoured Atlas or something. True to Geo Mommy's patrician tastes, she appreciates having strong weapons that can boost her low damage scaling. 2 piece Archaic Petra should be a mainstay, followed by a 2 piece attack set of your choice. Shimanawa or Gladiator for a generalist playstyle, or 2 piece Noblesse for focused ult damage. 4 piece Bolite isn't bad either, since she can tech technically make her own shields, but bring Zhongli or another shielder anyway for more consistent shield uptime. Five star cryo support saver, the last of the five permanent five stars that can spook you in character gotcha. I don't even need to open up with a meme here, like, you guys already know all the memes about this zombie lolly. Kui Kui's skill is the cryo version of that annoying ass fairy who keeps saying, hey! It's an orbital that deals cryo damage both on activation and over time since the orbital spins the wind around your active character every so often. While it's up, Zombie Land Saga Simulator can heal your team all at once with the normals in charge attack, and it scales off her own attack. The orbital itself also heals your active character every time it does a Vey O. Note that this skill has a long duration but an absurdly long cooldown, so try not to rely on its healing too much if your Chi Chi doesn't have Sack Sword. Her ult blasts cryo damage in a large AO 
gateway around herself and puts talismans on all enemies that get hit like her name's Reimu. These talismans heal whichever character does damage to those tagged enemies so long as they remain. Ideally, the way you play her is... You don't. You just don't. But since I gave Amber a full rundown, it'd be unfair to Lolyshenko if I didn't give one to her too, so here we are. Endo Reimu is all about energy management. Her ult is a fucking 80 cost for some reason? In a game where ults like these are only 60 or even 40. And to give her an even harder time, her skill doesn't even generate energy for her unless she's C1, though that might not be as big of a problem for a lot of you as I might think. She really needs a cryo battery, who's probably going to end up being your team's DPS anyway because of, you know, double cryo resonance, or at the very least a team that can generate energy fast as a whole. So if you're going to use her at all, you have to make sure that her ER needs are covered first and foremost, unless you're feeling kind of cheeky and you don't feel like you need to rely on her ult at all. To ensure that you're healing your team evenly, you need to either have Chi Chi attack enemies herself, which is a bad idea in most cases since that's a straight up DPS loss, or use her ult and then have each of your characters attack enemies to get some heals. With the exception of her orbital, she can't directly heal enemies herself, and her skill doesn't heal quite as fast as you'd like it to most of the time anyway. This method of indirect healing is very inefficient, and all the other healers in the game do a much better job of it. Yes, even Kokomi, as surprising as that might be to some of you. Combine this with the relative lack of other utility that she has, and you start to see why every Genshin player dreads losing the 50-50 because of this girl, since she'll make most of your gacha dreams as cold and dead as she is. Zhongli owes her an apology at some point if Mihoya won't do it, that's for sure. If you insist on maining her anyway because you care more about the cute than the meta, that's quite commendable, but you're still going to be put on a watch list somewhere. Sack Sword is ideal on her, but you really want to have as many refinement levels on it as you can. And if you don't have a lot of those to go around, especially when other characters want it too, like Chinese Water Boy, then consider waiting for a Sack Sword raid up on Weapon Banner at some point or something. Other sword options include Scoured Blade, Flute, Favonius, Festering Desire, whatever gives a main stat that's relevant to Chi Chi. Surprisingly, she's a valid 4-piece Ocean Hue holder, so you'll have at least someone to give those pieces to while you're farming that domain for Husk Piece. It's either that, or four-piece tenacity, so that she has at least an extra layer of utility to give to the team that isn't just healing. And a more traditional set is four-piece maidens, or just two-piece maidens with a two-piece attack set. And since I didn't have anywhere better to say this, Chi Chi has the Liyue version of Klee's material passive, so even if you don't use her in combat because you're a meta whore and refuse to use characters that the community says are bad, she can at least still help you find materials if you're working on ascending Liyue characters in case you weren't already aware of the Teyvat interactive map at this point. Five-star Cryo Support Lancer. In case you haven't noticed by now, all of the Cryo characters in this game have probably at some point made you ask yourself one simple question. If Cryo, why hot? Except for these two, you're still going to jail for them. Shen Wu, wait, uh, wrong element, has two versions of her skill like a lot of other characters. The tap version has her do a quick forward lunge with her spear, tracking the nearest enemy within range, and doing cryo damage to any enemy in her way. The distance she covers with this is pretty nice, so you can use it to reposition her quickly around the field if you need to. Her hold skill after a short charge time hits the nearest enemy with a cryo blast with a moderate AoE. After cast, both versions also buff any cryo attack that your team does for a certain number of attacks, depending on the version. Tapping gives you 5 stacks of this buff, holding gives you 7. The cryo buff also has a time limit, so you have to use these buffs before they expire on their own, but holding this skill gives you some more time to use those buff stacks. Note that Shenhe's cryo buff applies to each successful hit that your team lands with their cryo attacks, which means hitting multiple enemies will burn through her cryo buffs faster. Her second passive gives her skill another layer of utility, and one that you actually need to pay attention to. Her tap skill also now buffs your team's skill and ult damage, and her hold skill now buffs your team's normal charged and plunge attacks. This works regardless of element. Changong's ult, while not exactly a nuke like it is in FGO, throws down a field at the nearest enemy that deals initial cryo damage, then deals cryo damage over time while it's active to any enemies within it. The AoE is comparable to Gen 
can use, which is probably intentional. It also reduces cryo resist and physical resist of all those enemies within the field. Shun's role is specifically a cryo damage buffer, in case you couldn't tell already. While she does have some non cryo related buffs, like her second passive and her ult's physical resist debuff, her main job is still to work with another cryo DPS in her team, since her skill is what she'll mainly be using. She's not your average brain dead support character either. With her relatively high cooldowns on her skill and second passive, you need to be mindful of both which version you want to use of her skill and how you want to use those cryo buffs that you get from it. She's not just some flowchart EQ bot who just spams skills and regurgitates ults whenever they have it ready like some characters are. Her biggest drawback is energy recharge. She has an 80 cost ult and a long skill cooldown. Sound familiar? So she has a hard time building up her ult on her own. So make sure to get some ER substats on her artifacts or even run her with an ER timepiece if you need to. Or make sure that your team has enough energy income instead. Consider getting her to C1 if you have the luck or the money to do so since it gives her an additional charge of her skill that goes a really long way in boosting her energy income on its own and her buff windows. Shenlong's best weapon is Calamity, since its passive works best with the, how her own cryo buffs work. It also has an absurdly high base attack with an attack percent main stat, so her cryo buffs get even stronger since they scale off Shenha's base attack. Take a shot every time I said the word attack in this sentence. Engulfing Lightning also works very well on her since it gives the ER that she desperately needs and it converts it into extra attack, both of which she greatly appreciates. Just make sure she doesn't get into any cat fights with Raiden over who gets to use it for the day. In general, attack or ER spears are the way to go, depending on how your Shenha is geared. 4-piece Noblesse is her target set as a support character, though do keep in mind that unless she has high enough ER, she's just not going to be able to spam it as much as some other support characters. Otherwise, go with 2-piece attack sets or 2-piece emblem in case you need the extra ER. And no, she is not having an incestuous relationship with her nephew. They don't live in Alabama. Five star Hydro DPS Archer, except not really. Uh, currently, the only playable Russian character in the game, since Mihoyo kind of murdered the hopes and dreams of Signora mains around the world, and since we don't have Snatchnaya available, and it won't be for another two or three years, I put him here because, well, Liyue is where he kind of shows up. Pop Tart's skill is a stance, not to be confused with a stand, however, that's Razor's thing. When he uses it, the initial activation itself does Hydro damage in a tiny AoE around him, kind of like Hu Tao's skill. But more importantly, he ditches whatever bow he's using and traces swords or spears or whatever and uses those instead. People die when they're killed, huh? The stance change turns his normals and charge attack into melee attacks that deal hydro damage and can't be overridden by other elements. This also gives him one of the longest auto combos in the game. Because of his stance mechanic, Popcorn has two ults. The first one done in his archer stance is a quick hydro arrow at the nearest target and deals AoE hydro damage. It also puts a special Riptide debuff onto all enemies that get hit by it for some time and refunds some of the ult cost back. The melee ult, however, has him do a big 360 AoE slash that does big hydro damage to all enemies around him. If they also had the Riptide debuff on them, this ult detonates them into AoE hydro damage as well. Of note, this ult version does not refund him any energy back, however. The Central Bank of Russia is a dedicated hydro DPS, and despite him trying to get good with a bow, you're gonna be using him in his melee stance for the most part unless you're a Giga Chad and unironically use him as an actual archer. He's also wondering where the 200k Mora that they've been keeping upstairs went, seeing that they, uh, kinda need the money right now. <laughs> Not that you'll tell them. Keep in mind that one of his passives lets him put the Riptide effect onto enemies if he crits them with a melee stance attack, so he doesn't need to rely on his bow form at all. Though there are certain times, mainly when his melee stance is on cooldown, where using a charge shot from his archer stance to put Riptide onto an enemy first is useful for setting up his ult later. Unlike most other DPS characters, there's a lot to consider when deciding on how you want to use your own child labor. His stance change has a longer cooldown the longer he's in his melee stance. 
so it's important to get a good feel for his ratio of DPS to a skill cooldown to figure out what you're comfortable with personally. Naturally, this depends on a lot of factors of its own. What team you're running him on, what elemental reactions they offer, his artifact set and substats, etc. His weapon options are also not as simple as just equip and forget. If you want to play optimally, some bows actually call for different combo routes depending on what they are. In addition, he's got a passive that increases your entire party's normal attack talent level by one, including himself, so you can also consider giving him teammates who also have strong normal attacks of their own, and can complement him as either a secondary DPS or be the main DPS themselves, while Tartaglia acts as a secondary DPS, who comes in swinging with his melee stance and blows people up with his riptide mechanic. Any of the five star bows work perfectly well on Tartar Sauce, Polar Star, Pulse, Harp, or Ammo Spell, though he does lean more towards the Crypt Bows naturally. Viridescent is great if you're a BP gamer, and he can even run the Moon Moon Bow if you have a spare copy of that. Rust, Hamayumi, Stringless, and Slingshot are all the lower tier options, but still good in the right hands. 4-piece Heart is his default set, but not required, as 2-piece Heart with a 2-piece attack set performs only slightly worse, which is good if you don't have enough good Heart pieces. 2-piece Noblesse is also viable if you play a Pop-Tart who focuses more on big ult damage. 4-piece Shimanawa can be better than 4-piece Heart, but only in single rotation burst windows. Otherwise, it'll cut down on his long-term DPS because of its energy consumption. Four star Pyro off field DPS. Her favorite band is Red Hot Chili Peppers, and her favorite chef is Gordon Ramsay, so make sure she isn't stalking Klee in her free time. Size XL's skill is a god. No, seriously, he's a god. He just looks like a Teletubbies reject. When she uses it, she calls him in directly in front of herself, and he automatically starts barfing fire in the general direction of the closest enemy that does AoE pyro damage to any enemy caught in it because he thought eating raw Carolina Reapers was a good idea. Just like Benny Boy, her ult is her bread and butter. It's a huge pyro destructo disc that she summons and spins around her or your active character in a clockwise direction dealing AoE pyro damage. XL Spreadsheet has the gold standard of a simple but effective kit in Genshin Impact. Literally all she has to do is chuck gumbo down and spit some super hot fire while her team does the rest. I know I said the same thing about Kea from before, but let's face it, more people use Shangling than Kea. She's called the people's choice for a goddamn reason. Because of the ult's sheer duration, it's crucial in elemental reaction teams, especially Vape and Melt, and your Hydra and Cryo DPSs have a lot of time to capitalize on enemies who get hit by Shangling's ult. But that's really kind of it. Her ult, while it is decently strong in its own right, is mainly there to enable other elemental reaction teams to amplify the team's damage overall. Her second passive also has Gumbo drop a red hot chili pepper while singing Black Summer. That pepper gives your team a small attack buff if you pick it up. It's rather inefficient since you have to go out of your way to grab it unless you're already right next to it, and if it's too much of a hassle to get it, you can just ignore it since the attack buff itself isn't like enormous. Panda Express is an ult bot through and through. All you need to worry about really is having enough ER on her so that she can hit her ult rotations consistently and comfortably, and you're probably doing it right. Staff Ahoma, Engulfing Lightning, and the Catch are Shangling's preferred weapons, but she can work with a huge variety of spears to the point where she can probably just take whatever you're not using at the moment. And if you don't have a lot of spears, then just Favonius is good enough too. She's also another 4-piece emblem holder for obvious reasons, but 4-piece Crimson is good too, though keep in mind that some weapon options will have a significant influence on what artifact set you should be running on her. Of course, 2-piece Crimson with other 2-piece attack sets are nice too, and 4-piece Noblesse is good for a more support-oriented Shangli. Five-star Onimo DPS Lancer. True to his character, he shows up just about everywhere you call his name. Here, there, over there, over here too. Hutado's skill, other than teaching quintuplets, is a quick dash that tracks the nearest enemy and rushes forward with a spear that does Animo damage to any enemy in his way. It's very reminiscent of Shenha's skill, which might imply that he taught her this move himself at some point. Genshin lore experts, lore checkers, can, can, can we get some lore experts in here please? It's not as mechanically complicated as Shenha's skill though. It's a straightforward combat skill that Xiao can use for repositioning and energy gain. One thing 
that it can do that Shunhos can't is be used mid-air, which is novel but can be used to cover huge distances quickly, especially when his ult is up, though you'd rather not do this for reasons I'll explain later. Kirito's ult, Starburst Stream, is a little different in this arc. He puts on a mask like he's about to go loud on a one-down run on Death Sentence difficulty, then goes Super Saiyan. Thank god it doesn't take him half a season to do that. It's an install ult that does multiple things. It gives him mad hops that'll put him on any NBA team that he wants, infuses his attacks with anemo damage that can't be overridden, and increases his attack AoE and damage. This comes at the cost of constant HP drain on himself, because he's remembering all the cringe, generic, angsty male anime protagonist shit he said throughout Genshin's story. But you know, some of you may be into that. Just remember that you can prematurely end his ult by swapping him out, so be careful not to do that by accidentally hitting your 1-4 to four buttons or the sides of your tablets or your phones somehow. Arene's ideal gameplay can be boiled down to four words. He's a pogo stick. No, not pog-o, not corn dogs. Pogo. With the perks that his ult gives him, Zhao can abuse plunge attacks so hard his Twitter fangirls wish that they were his plunge attacks, or at the very least, the ones getting plunged into. His infused plunge attacks can basically CC lightweight enemies because it'll knock them up into the air a little, and Zhao can loop this until they die or his ult runs out. They don't have to be against groups of light enemies either, he can easily go toe to toe with single target boss enemies too, though he might have some issues with certain enemies like Ruin Hunters or Eyes of the Storm. Like Shunha, he also has an energy game problem. His skills specifically won't produce energy if he uses them while he's ulted, and his ult cause is some weird 7 cost instead of the usual 60 or 80, so save his skill charges for when he's about to ult, then spam them all before he ults, that way he can pick up the energy particles that his skill charges made and have a head start on recharging once he's done ulting. Also give him an Anemo teammate to give him more consistent ult rotations. Zhao Hai's preferred weapon is Jade Spear, but most 5 star weapons that aren't ER work just fine. He's mainly looking for an offensive spear since true to Adeptus lore, the only thing he knows how to do is beat the shit out of bad guys, so he's not entirely familiar with other concepts such as energy recharge and support. Before the Chasm update, Two-Piece Viridescent and Two-Piece Attack Set was his ideal artifact set. Now his BIS is probably Four-Piece Vermilion, but the issue is that most of you Zhao mains already have your edgy Chinese Demon Slayer geared out with pieces that took you the last 10 months to farm for, so your mileage may vary. He's an exception in the fact that he doesn't need set bonuses as much as the rest of the cast does, since he's already getting tons of Animo and attack buffs in his own kit. So you can unironically run him with mismatched pieces if they can give him better crit and ER substats. Just don't give him two-piece noblesse, whatever you do, as that doesn't actually buff his damage when he's ulted since it's an install. Four star Hydro off field DPS Saber. If Shangling is the queen of off field pyro damage, then Ike Eveland is the king of off field hydro damage. His skill is a two hit uppercut that he took from Oria and Undernight that deals hydro damage. It also creates three orbital hydro swords that increase your active character's interruption resist and reduce their damage taken, one hit for each sword. Using the skill also puts the wet status on your active character, so be careful when facing cryo enemies. His first passive also makes it so that when a Rain Sword is used up or runs out of time, it'll heal your active character for a bit of HP based on Xing Cho's max HP. Virgil's ult is where he gets truly motivated. Instead of summoning his Rain Swords defensively like his skill does, he starts using them offensively. Whenever your active character normal attacks, they also chuck Xing Cho's Rain Swords towards their target that deal hydro damage on top of whatever damage they're doing in the meantime. The ult also puts the wet status on him on activation, so same warning about facing cryo enemies as with his skill. Since he's essentially the Hydro version of Shangling, XQC has a similar game plan and gear requirements as her. He's there mainly for his ult that can consistently do Hydro damage that your main DPSs can use to trigger their own elemental reactions like Vape or Freeze, which means he's Hu Tao's favorite person to hang out and vape with. Of note, Xingqiu, Shangling, Chongyun, and Bennett make up what the community calls the National Team. This team is renowned for being very easy to use and having great damage output and performance considering 
considering all four of them are just four stars and relatively accessible. So, if you're new to Genshin and don't have a good idea of how to properly build teams, but you do have a majority of these characters, start here. Sack Sword provides the best synergy for Water Boy. Recall that his skill has two hits, and Sack Sword's passive can trigger off either of them, so he has two chances, basically, to reset his skill, which is obviously really nice, especially considering that his skill has a really long cooldown. Ideally, though, you get it to at least R3, so that it can start consistently resetting his skill. If he has high enough ER with just his artifacts, then you can give him a damage sword instead. Jade Cutter is his best option since it's such a fat stat stick. Mist Splitter is good too, assuming you somehow don't have someone better to run that with, or even Summit Shaper for the raw attack boost, especially with the Shielder. And of course, Harbinger is the El Cheapo option that still works well with proper Xingqiu play. Four Piece Emblem is perfect on him, though if you already have a solid Two Piece Noblesse and Two Piece Heart set on him, then you don't need to go out of your way to refarm pieces just for him. 4-Piece Noblesse is for extra team support, and he has more niche sets like 4-Piece Blizzard or 4-Piece Thunder Soother, specifically for Freeze and Electro Charge teams, respectively. Four star Pyro support? Or, uh, DPS Claymore? Uh... What? Shinyan's an oddball, which I guess makes sense considering she's a rock and roll performance artist in a game where the vast majority of its OST is not that. Her skill is a quick short range AoE swipe that deals pyro damage and puts up a shield whose strength scales off of her defense and how many enemies she hits with her skill. If she somehow hits three or more enemies with her skill, then her shield that she creates hits level three, at which point it starts pulsing with pyro damage at short range. Her first passive decreases that number down to two so it's not as bad, but you still really want her at C2 anyway, especially in situations where you don't have multiple enemies to attack. Perhaps the most interesting thing that the shield does is that that it applies the pyro status briefly to your active character. Every time you switch to another character, the shield reapplies the pyro status to them as an elemental cleanse, and it'll keep doing this until it breaks or expires, though it won't cleanse certain elements as well as others, most notably Hydro. Her ult, through the fire and flames, blasts her immediate surroundings with a big ass explosion. It does damage in two parts. The first part deals physical damage, and the follow-up flames do pyro damage, obviously. You would expect the fire to be doing most of the damage, but it's the opposite way around for some fucking reason. So this gives Dragon Force a physical DPS role, especially at C2, where her ult's physical damage is guaranteed to crit. Her second passive also gives her or your active character extra physical damage if they have her shield up. All the pyro stuff that she has in this playstyle is just extra, so think of her as kind of a, uh, a four-star pyro version of a physical kecking. She shares a lot of the same auto-attack animations as Beidou, probably to imply that Beidou's been teaching her how to fight while they've been sailing around together. The fact that Shinya's auto combo has one less hit, though, means that she's not exactly on Beidou's level yet, clearly. Because of that and the general sluggishness of her auto combo, Shenyan ideally wants to pull a Noel and turn into a Beyblade with her charge attack since it has a much higher attack speed. Alternatively, she can swing all the way over to the other side of the spectrum and become a support instead. She can be a physical damage support, but she needs both her second passive and C4 to get to that point, which probably isn't worth it for most of you since the vast majority of you don't even know who this character is to begin with. So the support role that's unique to her is a shield support whose shield has its own elemental application Pyro in this case, and can buff the team if she runs 4-piece tenacity. She'll need to be at C2 and have Sack Greatsword, but that's considerably cheaper than trying to use her as a physical support at least. Because of her polar opposite playstyles, her gear flip-flops just as hard too. As a DPS, ironically, she's a natural Scoured Pride user since it provides near-perfect synergy with her kit as a physical DPS, especially with its passive. Other options include Unforged, Gravestone, naturally, or Broken Pines as the 5-star options, and Serpent Spine, Star Silver, Archaic, Lithic Blade, or even Skyrider Greatsword at high refinement levels, assuming you didn't burn all your copies on accident already. Support Shinyan mainly wants Sack Greatsword, but she can work with White Blind or Favonius Greatsword too. 
I'm actually not sure why the spreadsheet that I mentioned at the beginning of the video also recommends Fish Moly and Archaic as support weapons, so I'll just assume that I'm the dumbass for not figuring that out on my own and recommend them to you too. For artifact sets, go with the physical sets. Four Piece Pale Flame is actually tricky to use on her, so Two Piece Pale Flame and Two Piece Bloodstained is generally more consistent. Regular attack sets can also work because the only thing that scales with defense in her kit is her shield's HP, so she doesn't actually care much for defense stats here. 4-piece Bolide and 4-piece Bloodstained can also work, though keep in mind for 4-piece Bloodstained, you do need to get a kill first to get its 4-piece effect. For support, 4-piece Noblesse or 4-piece Tenacity. If you want more out of her shields though, then throw in 2-piece Husk along with something else. For 4-star Pyro DPS Caster. No, she won't scream objection like an amateur lawyer, she'll just blow your ass up in court instead. Also, her hat makes her look like she wouldn't be terribly out of place in a new Toho game. Hayasaka's skill, other than being a maid as a side hustle, pops the nearest enemy with an explosion, doing AoE pyro damage. While her normal attacks are projectiles by default, her skill, however, is not, and it blows up her target as soon as you hit E, or whatever your skill button is. When you hit an enemy with her skill, Yanfei immediately gains Scarlet Seals. These seals decrease her stamina consumption for each seal that she has, which applies to everything that she does that take stamina, which are dashing and charge attacks. Normally with her auto, she can only gain one seal per attack, but with her skill, she instantly gets max seals. Normally this number is 3, but if you have her at C6, it goes up to 4. The stamina consumption decrease is massive when she's holding max seals, which lasts until they expire on their own after a short while, or when she charge attacks, which will immediately consume all those seals and make that charge attack do more damage. But since dashing doesn't consume them, Yanfei has surprisingly high mobility for a catalyst user who relies on her charge attacks for a good portion of her damage. I'm looking at you, Klee. You can easily see the number of seals that she currently has in her possession since they'll be following her around closely behind her when she gets them, and when she uses her charge attacks, the numbers that show up over Yanfei herself is the number of seals that just got consumed with her last charge attack, so you have a much better idea of her exact performance. Phoenix Wright's ult detonates AoE pyro damage all around her in a one-time explosion but more importantly, it auto-generates seals for her at a rate of one seal per second and increases her charge attack damage both for a short period of time. You can basically boil down Yanfei as the 4-star version of Klee, but that comparison is only going to give you half the story. Recall that one of the biggest problems you have to deal with when using Klee is her propensity to hog the entire stamina bar to herself. But with Yanfei, on the other hand, you don't have to deal with that anywhere near as much thanks to her Scarlet Seal mechanic, and so the gameplay options you have with her as your Catalyst DPS expand significantly. At the very least, she relies nowhere near as much as Klee does on a teammate who provides shields for her, and even less so if she's C4, which gives her her own custom shield. It's still nice to have Zhongli with her though. Her auto combo is simple, it's only 3 hits and you spam all 3 of them for max seals. After her 3rd auto attack, hold down left click, that way you buffer a charge attack that'll come out right after the 3rd auto hit and consumes the seals you've generated for it. You can open up with her skill and charge attack right away, or save the skill for when you need to reposition and want Yanfei to use the seals that she gets for more efficient dashes to get around the map better. Whatever you want to do with the best girl from Kaguya-sama. Of note, because her C4 gives her her own shield, as I mentioned earlier, you can use her as this sort of weird but inefficient shielder where she does nothing but provide shields for your team and specs into HP percent and energy recharge to make that shield as strong as possible. I assume the logic behind this is that Yanfei is pyro, so that way you can run double pyro resonance with some shielding capabilities for your team, but then again, why do that when you already got this guy running around leeching more off your ass? Feilong's weapons are what you'd expect for a DPS caster like her to use. Skyward Atlas, Memory of Dust, Lost Prayer, Kagura, Witsith, Dotoko Tales, Solar Pearl, etc. If you are interested in running her as that weird shield support that I mentioned, then throw her a copy of Prototype Amber, Favonius Codex, or even Thrilling Tales. Four Piece Crimson is, of course, best in slot, but Yanfei has an uncommon synergy with Four Piece Wanderers because her second passive automatically sets off a follow up attack whenever she charge attacks if her charge attack crits, and that follow up attack is also tagged as additional charge attack damage. 
you can also just mix and match two-piece wanderers and two-piece crimson if you prefer that. Four-piece retracing bolide is cool for the same reason that it's good on Klee, especially, like I said, if you have a C4 Yanfei. I wouldn't personally recommend four-piece Shimanawa, but if you can make it work, then go for it. If you're looking at a shield support Yanfei, go for two-piece emblem, two-piece tenacity, or just good old four-piece noblesse. Just make sure to clean out and organize your artifact inventory from time to time. Otherwise, Hayasaka's gonna come in to audit the fuck out of you with this look on her face. 4-star Geo Support Lancer. What she doesn't want you to know is that she's got all of Shin Yan's merchandise and god knows how many glow sticks from all of Shin Yan's concerts. Her skill is a parry and a counter, just like Beidou's. Maybe she took group lessons with Shin Yan while they were traveling around with Beidou together, I don't know. It has most of the mechanics of Beidou's parry with one important difference. It charges on its own without the need to take hits from enemies. While that sounds a lot better than Beidou's parry at first, remember that Yunjin is a spear user and Beidou's a claymore user, so Beidou's parries are still going to hit way harder than Yunjin's for the most part. You don't want to be using Yunjin's parries for their damage anyway because her role isn't a DPS. Kuroneko's ult does short range AoE geo damage and then buffs your team with a total of 30 stacks of a normal attack buff that scales with her defense. Her ult gives her a niche role as a normal attack buffer, and as such you only really bring her along when you plan on running a DPS who relies on normal attacks like Yoimiya or Hu Tao if you're not charge attacking with her for whatever reason. Her second passive also somewhat incentivizes you to give her teammates who are all different elements for the maximum normal attack buff bonus with her ult, but it's not such a huge buff that you have to abide by it. Because of the niche nature of her support role, you want to get as much out of Yun as possible, so her constellations are very valuable and the higher level she is, the better, especially at C6 where she then gives an attack speed buff to your normal attackers on top of everything else. Yun Yun has a pretty short list of preferred weapons since we don't have any defense percent spears in the game yet, so she'll take energy recharge spears in the meantime for maximum ult uptime. So pick whatever's your best or just good old Favonius Lance like usual. 4 piece husk is her best artifact set to get the most out of her ults, followed by 2 piece husk and 2 piece emblem. 4 piece noblesse is also acceptable for its additional attack buff if you don't have enough good husk pieces. And of course, just as a reminder, if your Yunjin is running Favonius, then get some crit stats on her artifacts so that she can use his passive better. If nothing else, she can take all those shitty defense artifacts and substats that you can't stop rolling because your name is Slice and your chat's been calling you the defense archon for the past 13 months. Five star Geo God. He's also the god of lying flat in China, which might explain why he's broke all the damn time. Vox Akuma's skill is his huge dick that he plants into the ground in front of him. Don't ask how it's detachable, unless you've watched Seth's review on Amazing Cultivation Simulator. And what does it do? All of this. This. The tap version puts down one tetherball pole, which deals geo damage to any enemy that it hits. It's a geo construct that pulses every so often, as if we didn't have enough phallic jokes for one character segment already. Those pulses do geo damage to enemies who are close enough, too. If those pulses can reach another Geo Construct, it'll chain to that other Construct, and that'll start pulsing with the same Geo Pulse too. Remember this mechanic when you start exploring the Chasm area, you'll want to bust out your local broke-ass Archon to help you out with some of the puzzles there. The Hold version has a short casting time, but not only does it set up the same Tetherball pull, but it also puts up a custom shield for Zhongli himself, or whoever your active character is, that scales off his max HP. The activation itself also does AoE Geo damage, and if there are Geo enemies within range, it'll drain them of their Geo energy. The most noticeable example of this is Geo Slimes, whose armor gets instantly broken if Zhongli does his hold skill near them. The shield itself not only blocks incoming damage, but also reduces the elemental resist and physical resist of all nearby enemies within a short radius. Long story short, possibly the single best skill in the game right now. If Torbjorn's skill is like a college thesis, then his ult is more like a pop-up book. While he doesn't yell, he does take your order at McDonald's, then smashes your ass with a big ass meteor harder than Vox's viewers want him to do the same to them. If you're a big fan of dinosaurs, you're definitely gonna have nightmares whenever you press Q with this guy. If somehow an enemy is still standing from getting smacked in the face by a big fucking rock that killed all the dinosaurs, they get petrified for a couple seconds, letting you do whatever you want to them because they can't do shit back. So before his buff, he was intended to be a shield and utility support with a bonus ability to
to freeze enemies in place with his ult. His ult did some damage, but for the most part, he wasn't meant to be a DPS. But now, thanks to his buff, he's such an alpha that he doesn't need to choose between support or DPS, he can just be both, mainly because of his 40 cost ult that he can spam relentlessly as long as his team has good enough energy income. And if you disagree with this buff, say goodbye to your social credit score. And of course, like I mentioned before with Ningguang, he's your resident miner and rock farmer and likes to go on romantic geology dates with her. Uh, whenever Beto ain't looking, that is. Because of Professor Sujimon's strong ult and shielding, his best roles cater towards them, though with how well he performs in both, these roles more or less blend into each other past a certain point of investment. He's also a shockingly good physical DPS too, because of his fast auto combo and his hold skills physical resist debuff. If you're somehow able to produce some serotonin from watching enemies get tickled to death with spear-based physical damage. Basically, he's like Ganyu in that he too can play however he wants because he's motherfucking Zhongli. His hard counter, however, is the relatively recent corrosion mechanic and the more recent rift hounds, as you Zhongli mains know painfully well and can't seem to deal with for some reason. I would advise you to try not to rely on his shields too much now that we have mechanics like this in the game, but I feel like I'm a year too late to be telling you this. Staff of Homeless, appropriately, is famously his best weapon, but since his ult doesn't scale with anything, he can rock other offensive spears like Jade Spear, Calamity, or even Vortex Vanquisher that some people on Twitter kept bugging Mihoyo to bring back for the past 12 months for some reason. He'll also take energy recharge spears like Scoured Spine, Engulfing Lightning, or their 4-star versions. For raw-ass shield support, Black Tassel is unironically his best option since it's literally the only HP spear in the game, unless you count Staff of Homa's passive, that is, followed by Favonius if you don't want to sacrifice too much of his own energy gain. For physical damage, Crescent Pike is best because it also is the only physical damage spear in the game for now. Otherwise, any of your usual damage spears will work here, or even White Tassel if you're extra poor. Four Piece Tenacity is his main set for a shield support role, but it can also work for a burst support role too, though Four Piece Emblem is better for that if you care more about his own personal damage instead. Otherwise, go with 2-piece Archaic, 2-piece Noblesse, or even 4-piece Noblesse if you don't have 4-piece Tenacity yet. 4-piece Pale Flame is his default for a physical damage roll, otherwise give him any of the usual sets that a physical DPS would want. That does it for the Liyue characters, now for the region y'all have been waiting for, Japan. <laughs> 5-star Geo DPS Claymore. Ito is the resident himbo of Genshin Impact in case the other gentlemen don't interest you somehow or if you specifically have a thing for big guys with exposed six-packs. Luka Kanashiro's skill, besides saying pog every two seconds like a bootleg XQC, has him chuck a cute little cow at the nearest enemy like he's playing dodgeball. Actually, it's a bull, but Ito doesn't have a Red Bull sponsorship so he ain't got no wings. He does have a red horn though, but that depends on how rich or poor you are. When Ushi Wakamaru headbutts enemies, he'll do geo damage to them and then taunt them. Since he's a geo construct, he has his own health pool that scales with Ito's max HP, and he leaves a field either when his time is up or when his HP gets depleted from all the enemies he's taunting smacking him back. Ushio also provides charge attack stacks for Ito that we'll discuss in a minute. He gives one stack on initial activation when he hits enemies, one stack each time he takes damage while taunting enemies, and one more stack when he leaves the field for any reason. Ito has a whole version of this skill, but it just lets him control exactly where he's chucking his Red Bull, or in other words, about as useful as Fischl's hold skill for Oz. Akuma's ult is an install that lets him do custom combos like he's playing A Groove in CVS 2. Eh, kind of, that's a bit of a stretch, I'm not gonna lie. It first infuses all of his attacks with Geo that can't be overridden, increases his attack speed, and gives him bonus damage based on his defense. In addition, the first and third hits of his auto combo give him one charge attack stack each, the same one that I mentioned for his skill. Okay, time to talk about those charge attack stacks. While he does have the stock charge attack animation that he can do if he has no stacks, just like how you have no bitches, he has access to a unique one if he has these charge attack stacks that he gets from his skill and auto combo, both regular and ulted. 
This special charge attack consumes no stamina and slashes upwards instead of horizontally. The number of charge attacks that he can do like this are determined by, you guessed it, how many charge attack stacks he's built up beforehand. The first charge attack that he does also tracks the nearest enemy and basically teleports him to them. And the final one is a strong downward smash into the ground. Ito also stays in place once he starts getting his special charge attacks going. This is convenient because he has a tendency to sometimes overshoot his target when his first charge attack teleports him to them, and his charge attacks also have a hitbox on their tail end so he can still hit enemies behind him. One note I should add here, using his skill or dashing out of his auto combo at any time won't reset the combo. He'll continue where he left off instead to make sure that he can consistently get his charge attack stacks. Beefcake's primary goal is to build up 5 charge attack stacks before ulting since that's the max number that he can hold. That way he can immediately start charge attacking and do big beefy damage when he's got his Geo Infusion going. And since his own damage multipliers are fantastic, so long as he's geared out well, and since he's Geo, he's a more independent DPS who's free to do his own thing for the most part, greatly reducing his reliance on teammates to buff him. Ito shares a lot of his gear with his fellow defense scaling Claymore sister from another region, Noel. so Red Horn, Serpent Spine, and White Blind are what he's looking for. He can also use Skyward Pride in case he doesn't have any ER substats in his artifacts, though he'd really prefer using one of the other Claymores if he does have good enough ER without it. Four-piece Husk is his ideal artifact set, naturally, followed by four-piece Bolite or two-piece sets of Husk, Archaic Petra, or Emblem. If you run both Serpent Spine and Four-Piece Husk on your Ito, note that they conflict in terms of how they build stacks for themselves, so prioritize Serpent Spine stacks over the Husk ones. <laughs> Four star Geo Support Archer. He moonlights as the Komodo Tea House owner whenever he's not on duty, but either way, he's part of the very good boys club with Razor. Shiba Inu plants a flag into the ground for his skill, kind of like what Dogecoin would have done too if it could when it got blasted to the moon. It constructs a static field that provides different buffs depending on how many Geo characters Goro has on his team. The initial activation itself, when Goro puts down his field, does Geo damage to enemies who are close enough. The buffs from his skill have three levels. When Goro is the only Geo character, his field only gives a defense bonus to the team. At level 2, or when he has another Geo teammate, his field also increases his team's interrupt resist. And at level 3, or when he has two other Geo teammates, his field then gives a Geo damage bonus. He can only have one field up at any given time. If he redeploys it, then the new field will take the old one's place. Goro can also hold his skill for more accurate placement, but like the hold version official skill and Ito skill, in what context you'd need to do this is kind of beyond me. Garou's ult is basically a stronger version of his skill and more or less the poor man's albedo ult. Its initial activation also does geo damage and sets up another field that has the same effects as his skill with two more perks. It now follows your active character around so that they always benefit from its bonuses from before. It also does intermittent AoE geo damage that targets one random enemy within it but can damage multiple enemies if they're grouped together close enough. If there are any elemental shards on the ground inside the ult field, it'll pull one of them in towards your active character to give them a shield in quick intervals at the same rate that the ult does damage. Golden Retriever has the niche of being a geo buffer for anyone who scales with defense, which means that the only team that utilizes his kit to its fullest potential is, well, him, Ito, Noel, and a fourth teammate of your choice. Preferably a healer unless your Noel is your healer, though you can give him other Geo teammates if you prefer. Either way, he lets you unironically run triple Geo teams, which used to be every Geo main's wet dream before Goro came out, and now it's reality. Dreams do come true sometimes, I guess. His C4 turns him into a healer if he has at least one other Geo teammate, giving him an extra layer to his support to the point where his C4 Goro could be used as a solo healer, which is very useful for those who might not have a lot of healers built up yet. Then again, if that's the case, how the hell is your Goro C4 in the first place? Amaterasu has an 80 cost ult, which means energy recharge is an important stat for him. Since there aren't any defense bows either, he has to sell for ER bows, and the only three are, well, Favonius, Sackbow, and Elegy. Favonius and Sackbow are preferred, and it's mostly down to personal preference which one you go for. Defense stats actually aren't required on Goro because the only things in his kit that scale with it are his 
own personal damage whenever he pops his skill or ult, and it's ult's periodic geo damage. So his artifacts are surprisingly flexible in terms of both their sets and stats. So, Four Piece Noblesse is an easy choice because of his support nature, though make sure he's getting enough ER to have comfortable ult rotations. If not, run Two Piece Emblem and another Two Piece set of your choice. You can even give him Four Piece Exile, which is a four star set, as opposed to the usual five star set recommendations that I've been giving you throughout the video. Though you do need to be okay with the lowered main artifact stat scaling because they're just four star pieces. 5 star Animo damage support. What you don't know is that he's a secret collaboration character with Wind Boys that Mihoyo never told you about. Higuchi Kayade's skill is an Animo powered jump that pulls in enemies around him and then launches them at the same time, similar to Sucrose's and Venti's own suck effects from earlier. After doing this, Kazuo floats in the air for up to 10 seconds before falling back down to the ground on his own, but if he attacks while floating, he does his own version of a plunge attack that does follow up Animo damage if there are still enemies in range. This has a charged version that has a short cast time and a longer cooldown in exchange for more damage and a bigger AoE, and he can even use it midair, like how Zhao can use his too. The verticality that you get from his skill is great for exploration, and its midair use can extend your gliding time in case you need to reach places that are particularly far away. Akamatsu Kaede's ult smacks enemies around him with a big AoE Animo Slash that then sets up a field that does his own Animo damage over time to all enemies within it. Again, like Sucrose's and Venti's ults, this one can also absorb any one of the elements that theirs can, and deal additional damage of that type. Nobunaga Shimazaki's job on the surface is very similar to Sucrose's and Venti's. He's another elemental mastery based character who has crowd control. But while Sucrose buffs the team's EM, and Venti doesn't really have a team buff per se, unless you count his black hole murdering everything as support, Kazuo's second passive lets him grant an additional elemental damage bonus based on his own personal EM to the team. This gives him a much more immediate role as a damage support character, especially for characters who rely mostly on elemental damage, which should be most of them but notably Catalyst users. And unlike the other two, unless they've also got some serious stats on their artifacts, Kazuo can easily pack a punch himself despite his support role thanks to his first passive giving his skill a fat boost in damage, along with whatever other attack substats he might also have from his own artifacts. Of note, his C1 and C2 are both very powerful. His C1 makes his ult refresh the cooldown on his skill instantly, so you can do EQE combos with them for some good initial damage to help set up your team better. And his C2 gives him and his team 200 extra EM while they're inside Kazuo's ult, and his second passive counts that for even stronger elemental damage bonuses. Since you just want to stack hella EM on his ass, Freedom Sworn is his single best option, or UNSTICK if you're broke. But ER swords like Sack Sword, Favonius Sword, or Skyward Blade are nice too in case your artifacts don't quite provide the ER that he needs, especially Sack Sword if your Kazuo is only C0. If you're a Kazuo main, which I assume also means that, uh, Farting is one of your favorite tags on Sad Panda. Uh, I should mention here that running him with conventional crit gear is the same situation as running a crit based venti that we discussed earlier. It's doable and can be strong if invested into properly, but it's just so much more expensive than just brainlessly stacking EM on him, so it's not recommended. I just hope you have an Elemental Mastery Cup somewhere though. It's even worse for Kazuo specifically since the C6 gives him access to a much more active playstyle thanks to the Animo infusion that he gets from it, but it's fucking C6. Are you willing to pay for that? And if you are, is your credit card strong enough too? As you might expect, 4-piece Viridescent is the way to go on Mika Melatika because she can't seem to stop spamming her reverb fart sound effect on stream these days, or 4-piece Instructor if you're really broke on artifacts. He does have a very niche 4-piece Thundering Fury build that works only in AoE situations and in a specific team, but it's a meme build for the most part. And besides, you should be more concerned about whether or not you can even get an EM main stat cup to drop at all.
Five Star Cryo Blender. She's in fact Tom Dixon's daughter, and she's here to ask you one simple question. Will it blend? Kujo Kaden's skill shoots up cryo damage in a moderate field around her after a short cast time. It'll also launch lightweight enemies on hit. She also has the same special dash animation as Mona, with all the same properties, but since she's cryo, naturally if she's on water, she can freeze the water underneath her when she comes out of her dash. Though you don't want to do that either, since the water doesn't stay frozen long enough for her to start regaining stamina. And again, just like Mona, Yukino Shita Yukino's ult is the big hitter, and <laughs> that's an understatement. She puts enemies in a cryo washing machine that constantly does cryo damage to them and explodes when it expires to do even more cryo damage to any enemies that are still somehow alive by that point. Technically, the ult moves, but it doesn't move that much, to the point where you can even consider it stationary. So it works best against stationary enemies and can be outright useless against enemies who move around a lot if you use it at the wrong time. The better Shimakaze, yeah, I said it, is a cryo DPS machine all the way. Even in a game where cryo characters were stacked as fuck, both in the waifu and meta viability departments, before she came out, Ayaka manages to make herself relevant with an ult that does so much fucking damage that an Abyss speedrun competition on the Chinese server straight up banned her ass. Even when she doesn't have her ult up, she can do serious cryo damage with her normals and unique charge attack that'll make any EI Jutsu fan cream their pants when they see it. Her first passive gives her normals and charge attack extra damage after she uses her skill, and her special dash gives her a cryo infusion for a short time, which she can refresh easily since her second passive refunds her stamina and gives her extra cryo damage when her dash puts cryo onto an enemy itself. I alluded to this earlier, but the most important thing with Japanese Saint Martha is knowing when to use her ult. It's really strong, obviously, but also very expensive at 80 cost, and even with a cryo battery teammate, she can have a hard time getting it back after using it, as her skill has a longer than average cooldown time. So run her with Hydro teammates for a permafreeze team, that way you don't need to worry as much about using her ult at the wrong time. Miss Splitter is her best option, of course, using her with any other sword that's not a glorious katana made of honorable Japanese steel that's been folded a thousand times over would be heresy to the weeaboo doctrine. But if you're poor and therefore cannot uphold the exalted weeaboo doctrine and therefore must bring shame to the weeb that you are, just give Hayami Saori the best offensive sword that you have. You can even give her Akala Favoni for god's sake if that's the best you got since it at least has a very high base attack stat and an attack buff from its passive that Ayaka can make use of. Four Piece Blizzard is her best set, no questions asked. She just performs way too well in permafreeze teams to be used elsewhere, especially when freeze teams more or less solve her only problem of dealing with enemies with high mobility. If you are an aspiring Ayaka main, you should work towards getting her a good 4-piece blizzard set, but in the meantime, you can run any of the 2-piece attack sets, including Noblesse. <laughs> Five Star Hydro Flex Saber. He's Ayaka's older brother and has been forcing straight men around the world to look deep within themselves about their perceived sexuality. Kotaro Katsura's skill has him phase a short distance and leave behind a Hydro After Image in his wake. It works like Miko's skill in the sense that if you're holding a directional key when you use it, he'll phase forward in that direction, and well, if you're not, he'll just default to phasing backwards. The illusion acts like a claymore. No, not that kind, the modern kind. So when an enemy gets near it, it'll go off and do AoE Hydro damage. It'll also just go off on its own after enough times passed. But you don't give a fuck about the after image. Instead, the part of the skill that you do care about is the fact that it changes Ayato's normals into AoE Hydro slashes that'll make you question whether or not you still want to main Tartaglia. After all, it's not only the girls whom Ayato gets wet. While his normals are boosted like this, his skill also gives them the ability to buff themselves just for hitting enemies with more damage that scales off his HP, up to four stacks. It also gives him increased interruption resist, but it also locks him out of using charge or plunge attacks. Not that you care either. Gara's ult is yet another big AoE field, since Mihoyo can't seem to come up with a lot of other ult designs that aren't just slapping a big ass circle on the ground and making it fucking do shit. 
Maybe they'll change it up with whoever our next 5 star character is, we'll see. In Ayoto's case, his ult drops Hydro Swords down onto enemies within its field one after another in quick succession and does AoE Hydro damage to them. It also increases the normal attack damage of all the characters within it, including himself, of course. Kowaru Nagisa technically occupies the same role as Jean or Noel as a flex or hybrid character in that he can switch between his support and DPS roles on the fly, depending on what the situation calls for. In his case though, it's just a lot easier for him to do that since his quote-unquote support role happens to also buff his own damage. Ideally, you pop his ult, use his skill right in front of an enemy so that his illusion can get them drenched and experience many Ayato mains today can say they've had, then spam his normals until his skill runs out. Note that you can just hold down your attack button while he's doing his best Elden Ring Rivers of Blood Dexterity build impression, and he'll just keep attacking. You can also use him more passively by deploying his ult as damage support, or basically by using him as a 5-star Shincho, pretty much. Technically, to make the most of it, you'd also have to run another normal attack user, other than Ayato himself, obviously, but that would involve using a Yoimiya, whose first banner you skipped, or any physical damage character that you haven't used in the past 16 months. His second passive lets him auto-generate energy so long as his current energy gauge is less than 40 and he's not your active character, 2 energy per second. This lowers his ER threshold by quite a bit despite his ult being 80 cost, which opens up his teams since you're not pressured to give him a Hydro teammate or give him your Xingqiu Sack Sword just to help charge his ult. Speaking of Water Boy, naturally people are going to make comparisons between the two since they're both Hydro Sword users with relatively similar support roles. Other than their rarities and the fact that the Inazuma Festival and their previous Lantern Rite events, I think, offered you a free copy of Xingqiu, the biggest difference is that Ayato can do a little more than just spam E and Q. Not that you care, since you probably care more about the fact that you can just run Ayato and Ayaka together finally on the same team. And besides, that next new 5-star character that I was joking about earlier, I think she might be a bigger concern for him than Ayato is. Haran, Jade Cutter, and Mist Splitter are his three best weapons, surprise surprise. Jade Cutter in particular, since its passive gives him an HP boost that Ayato can definitely use, followed by Skyward Blade if his artifacts didn't roll any ER for some reason. Some notable 4 stars are Black Sword just for its crit stat, Kaguchi, or even Black Cliff Longsword for the crit damage. Lion's Roar is also viable on a Taser Ayato. Pick between 4-piece Heart and 4-piece Gladiator for his ideal artifact set, since their effects are actually quite similar to each other. And if you don't have 4-piece sets for either, you can just mix and match and go 2-piece for each until you're done farming the new Chasm artifact domain. But, as it turns out, 4-piece Echoes doesn't seem to be all that great, so uh, yeah, farm those pieces at your own risk. Some niche sets are 4-piece Blizzard for a Freeze Ayato and 4-piece Thundering Fury on a Taser Ayato. For his timepiece specifically, run him with attack percent instead of HP percent. I believe the reason for this is that you lose a bit of damage for his skill, but his ult gets a lot stronger since the only thing that scales with HP in Ayato's kit is his skill damage, but not his ult. 4 star Electro Burst Support Archer. Not related to Kujo Kaden from earlier, I was just using that as a voice actress joke. Neo Tangu teleports backwards a short distance when she uses her skill. Unlike almost every other skill in the game, its activation itself does no damage. Instead, Sarah can then shoot a charge shot that she can charge up a lot faster than usual thanks to her first passive. And when she shoots it, that charge shot puts down an electro marker where it stops, either when it hits the ground or when it hits an enemy. That marker then explodes with AoE electro damage, and the explosion that it creates buffs your active character with a big attack buff that scales off Sarah's base attack if they're physically inside the explosion's range when it goes off. It's basically a slightly weaker version of Bennett's ult buff and works the exact same way, with only the white number on Sarah's attack and her stat sheet counting for the buff. Of note, after Sarah pops her skill, her right hand will start glowing as a visual indicator to let you know that her next charge shot will put down a marker. That way, you don't need to guess if she has it or not in case you can't get off her charge shot after using her skill for whatever reason. She can hold her special charge shot for quite some time before it expires on its own, so you have plenty of time to use it if you need to reposition to make the most of it. Hasumi's ult casts an initial concentrated AoE Electro Blast directly on top of the nearest enemy. It then splits into four more lightning arcs that spread away from the original target perpendicularly and deal more AoE Electro damage along the way. The ult also grants your active character the exact same attack buff that her skill 
skill gives too. Shamemaru Aya can be boiled down to the Electro version of Bennett, but she's purely focused on buffing her main DPS's attack and doesn't have Bennett's healing so she isn't the all-around support that he is. So what she offers instead are two things. First, access to more frequent burst damage windows. Because her attack buff is on her skill, that means she can open up with it, then use her ult, and then use the skill again when it's off cooldown. That's three separate times when your DPS can enjoy having big damage compared to Bennett's single time with his ult. Second, Sarah's attack buff being on both her skill and her ult removes her reliance on her ult, and therefore makes her more viable in stages or against enemies that like to drain your energy, which is especially nice considering that her ult is 80 cost for some reason. This is in stark contrast to Bennett who lives and dies by his ult since that's the most important thing he has to contribute to the team most of the time. Perhaps her best known role is as an electro DPS buffer, because at C6, when her charge shot buffs an electro character, Himekaido Hatate also gives him a fat 60% crit damage bonus on top of the original attack buff. It's clearly meant to make her Raiden's or Miko's personal buff bitch, but most of you don't have access to this unless you wailed for her or Raiden back in 2.2 or more recently in 2.6. Weapon choices are pretty straightforward on Sarah, give her whatever gives her the biggest base attack increase like Bennett. In her case, because she's an archer, Harp is the best option because it's got the highest base attack stat of all the bows in the game, and then go down the list from there. The one exception is Elegy, whose passive works perfectly with her kit. It doesn't have as high of an attack stat as Harp per se, but in exchange, Sarah can give your team extra attack and elemental mastery buffs, and Elegy being an ER bow helps Sarah's ult rotation significantly. For her artifacts, Izunamaru Megumu wants either 4-piece Noblesse for even more team support, or a 4-piece emblem if you need the extra ER. The extra damage from emblem is, well, nice too, I guess. Speaking of damage, since the only thing that scales in her kit is the attack buff on her skill, you're actually free to build Sarah however you want, either with crit stats or just pure support stats. Five star Electro Hybrid Lancer. She's supposed to be a support, but then she said, nah, fuck that shit. Dedicated support roles are for pussies, and then proceeds to outdamage your DPS like it's no big deal. Raiden Mei's skill is Thunder Edge. Mihoyo can tell me to point out the differences between them, but I'm obligated to tell you that they're the same thing. Here in Genshin, it's a horizontal slash that deals AoE electro damage after a brief cast time. It then does three more things. First, when your active character does damage to an enemy, the skill will attack with them, doing consistent electro damage with your active character. And second, it buffs your active character's ult damage depending on how expensive that ult is. And third, it puts up a little purple eye over your active character's head. This little guy is a visual indicator for another one of Raiden's mechanics, Chakra Desiderata, which is an appropriate name given how most of Genshin's player base, Naruto ran their way into the servers back when her first banner showed up like it was Area 51. When Raiden's teammates either use their ults or gain energy particles or orbs, they give Raiden stacks called Resolve. When Raiden herself ults, she then consumes all those Resolve stacks, her team's built up to that point, and converts them into bonus damage for her own ult, and the max number of stacks her team can get for her is 60. When her team builds up Resolve stacks, the little eye will also charge up, and it'll fill up with more eyes the more stacks it gets. When it's fully lit up to make Raiden look like she's doing her best Zenyatta impression, that's how you know it's time for Raiden to go ham. Perfect segue into her ult, Amaterasu's Ride, though unfortunately it doesn't come with a cool dragon in this version of the game. Instead, Raiden does the whole booba sword thing that y'all never get tired of seeing, and literally rips your screen in half with another horizontal slash. After this initial slash, it then puts her into an ulted state, where all of her attacks are then converted into electro damage that can't be overridden. These attacks also build energy for the whole team, once every second up to 5 attacks. While ulted, Raiden also gains interrupt resist, and immunity to electro charge damage, but if she leaves the field early, she'll exit her ulted form instantly. While her kit sounds complicated, in practice it's actually pretty simple. Jack the Ripper puts up her skill, and then hangs back to let her teammates build up resolve stacks for her, occasionally swapping back in to refresh her skill. Once her Zenyatta balls are fully charged, she comes out, 
ults a bitch, and repeats the process. She's pretty much the I'm a healer meme, but the support version every time you press her Q. Because of her second passive, Raiden's most important stat is energy recharge, so she wants artifacts and weapons that give her that as much as possible, so engulfing lightning is her best option, with the catch being the free-to-play version of it. But she can easily take more damage-oriented spears for, well, obvious reasons. Oh, and guess what her favorite weapon is in Raiden 2. Four-piece emblem is tailor-made for Sawashiro Miyuki, so the instant you unlock the emblem domain in Inazuma, start farming. In the meantime, you can run two-piece attack sets with two-piece Thundering Fury as a placeholder. She can even use four-piece Tenacity, since her skill can proc Tenacity's buff easily, but this will gimp her own damage, which probably isn't worth it. Five star Hydro Support Caster. I know I memed Mona as Chica earlier, but this is just ridiculous. Finana's skill, other than pulling out her wallet for all the gacha games she plays, summons a little jellyfish that pulses with Hydro and deals Hydro damage to enemies nearby. She also makes herself wet for one instance upon activation, and she doesn't even need a wireless egg to do it. The jellyfish also heals your active character if they're in range at the same time, and this healing scales off Kokomi's max HP. Note that the jellyfish Hydro pulses won't apply wet to your active character outside of the first time for Kokomi herself. Genestra's ult is another install. Its initial activation does a bit of hydro damage in a short AoE around her, then boosts the damage of her normals, charge attack, and jellyfish attack for a short period of time. Her normals and charge attack also heal the team while she's ulted, and all of this scales off of her max HP too. As with every other install type ult, she loses these effects if she gets swapped out early. Kokomi is the most misunderstood character in Genshin Impact. Normies don't play her, and those who do usually get told by those normies things like lol negative 100% crit or cocopium or dude just use Barbara. Her first passive refreshes the duration of her jellyfish when she uses her ult. What this means is that with proper timing and ult rotations, Kokomi can provide infinite, independent Hydra application for the team. But that's not all. The beauty of her kit is that it's all consolidated into scaling off of one stat, which in Kokomi's case is HP. So everything she does, she does all at once, all the time. Damage, healing, and utility. Once she's built properly, she doesn't need to choose one thing or another. While this also applies to other support characters, Kokomi does the best out of all the healers in the game. This is demonstrated no better than in Permafreeze teams. Not only does Kokomi help keep enemies frozen with her infinite hydro, but all the while she's healing your team between her ult and her jellyfish. And if somehow someone on your team takes a lot of damage, Kobo also serves as a great anchor with all the HP that she's got, since well that's what her kit scales with, and she can keep your teammates safe while healing them when she's ulted, which also makes her one of the better healers against the recent corrosion effects and rift town enemies that half of you don't know how to deal with because because m m m m m Zhang Li shields. But hey, evidently, to most of the Genshin community, none of this shit matters because lol can't crit, so therefore bad, and we jerk ourselves off to watching YouTubers post big funny numbers with Bennett in their teams, so I guess her rerun banner shouldn't have meant shit to most of you. For the rare Kokomi enjoyers, or even future Kokomi enjoyers out there, choose one from these four following weapon options Thrilling Tales, Prototype Amber, Hakushin Ring, and Moon Glow. She's the only character in the game who can even justify by running Moon Glow, so if you're a Krispy Kreme enthusiast, you're in luck. You can also give her Sack Frags, that way she can get her skill back without her ult in case she either doesn't have the ER for good rotations, or you just find yourself missing her ult timings a lot. Four Piece Ocean Hue is your ideal artifact set. Shadow is probably made specifically for her, so it shouldn't surprise you that she's the best at consistently setting off its Four Piece effect. Four star Animo support Claymore. Try not to sing the City Escape theme when you put her into your team. Sonic's skill is, well, <laughs> self explanatory, but I'll explain it anyway. She turns into a frickin' roly poly and zooms around like a kid after eating five pixie sticks. The tap version is a short roll that ends with Sayu doing a little kick for some extra Animo damage, but the hold version is what lets her roll around at the speed of sound. Got places to go, gotta follow my. Fuck. Sayu's roll when held can also absorb one of the four infusible elements, and she'll do extra damage of that type while doing her best spiky-haired hedgehog impression. She can roll around for up to 10 seconds, though you can end it early by hitting E again, and she'll do the same little kick that does more damage at the end too. Laffy's ult does initial anemo damage in a small 
all AoE and heals your team all at once. It then throws out a fat egg that may or may not be a long lost cousin of Tectone's egg emotes that jumps around and does different things depending on your active character's HP. If your active character is in combat and their HP is over 70%, then the egg attacks the nearest enemy in range with an emote damage. If their HP is less than 70%, it'll heal them instead. If they're outside of combat though and they've lost some health, the ult will heal them even if they're already over 70%. In case her skill wasn't a big enough tell already, Sayu's kind of a meme. She's a healing support who wants three different stats, attack for her ult's heals, EM for her swirl damage, and ER for her 80 cost ult. So because of these conflicting stats, she's unfortunately more inefficient at healing than other dedicated healers. And if you want to double down on her sonic role, Sayu relies heavily on teammates giving her orbitals, like Sha Xiangling's ult, Xingqiu's ult, Raiden's skill, etc. while she rolls around, more so than other Animo characters who also have abilities that can absorb an element and are independent so you can bring in another character and do more damage on top of them. But hey, I'm a Kokomi main as you could tell from the previous segment so don't let me tell you what characters you should or shouldn't use or how to use them. If nothing else, Sayu's skill is hands down the single most hilarious skill in the whole game and that alone makes her worth playing. That and look at the itty bitty versions of the claymores you give her. For those of you who go crystal core farming regularly, remember that she has a passive that makes farming them a lot easier. So don't forget to stick her in your team when you run around chasing butterflies, which kind of sounds like the next step to the whole touch grass meme that most of you watching this video aren't familiar with. Like a lot of other Anemo characters, Kana doesn't need crits since most of her damage should be coming from reactions, which means she has better DPS with more EM focused gear, but better heals with more attack oriented gear. Preferably with plenty of energy recharge substats to help her with her ult rotations. Her best weapon is Wolf's Gravestone, surprising probably none of you. Assuming you even have the luxury of a spare copy to give her if your main Claymore DPS doesn't have one already. If you can give her one though, it not only boosts her damage and healing, but also buffs the team's damage thanks to its passive as another layer of support. Sat Greatsword is next on the list since it's energy recharge and can reset her skill so she can do two full Sonic sessions in a row. Rain Slasher and Blood Tainted Great sword are the two EM claymores in the game, but they're not the best choices because of their situational passives, but they are options in case she has the appropriate teammates to set up those reactions. If you're a rare Sayu main, maybe pray to Mihoyo to come up with a 5 star EM claymore at some point to help you convince your own ninja lolly to actually get the fuck out of bed on time for once. You already know what artifact set she ought to have, 4 piece Viridescent followed by 4 piece Noblesse for even more support. If you just need her as an ult bot, then 2 piece Emblem and 2 Two-Piece Maidens, or Ocean Hue. Four-star Pyro Support Lancer, the resident male wife of Genshin Impact and an in-universe weeaboo considering he took a boat and fucking sailed his ass all the way over to Inazuma on his own from Mondstadt. Considering who he ended up working for, a lot of you guys and gals would have done the same too. Kami Jotoma's skill, other than picking up girls on Twitter because of his male wife qualities, is a fire kick that does pyro damage in a small AoE. It puts pyro on him, which acts as an elemental cleanse, and gives him a custom shield that scales off his max HP. This shield's unique property is that if he can refresh his own shield, it'll stack its previous remaining HP with a new one, though there is an upper cap on how much total damage absorption it can stack. His ult puts out AoE pyro damage on activation, then puts on another custom shield. The ult also gives his shield the ability to spew fire every second whenever your active character uses their normals, dealing more AoE pyro damage. Thomas the Tank Engine is similar to Kokomi in that he can theoretically provide your team with infinite utility, in his case shielding, but his biggest problem is that there's another guy in the game who does the exact same thing as he does that Ayaka told him not to worry about. He is a permanent 4 star while Zhongli is a limited 5 star, so if you don't have CEO or GEO yet, you can use Imagine Breaker until Geo God inevitably gets put back on raid up whenever Mihoyo wants to make some quick cash. Same thing goes for his ult's pyro application. There's someone else in the game who's just uh, straight up better at that job than he is. Toma's kit is nice in the sense that he provides provides both shielding and pyro application at the same time, but then again, you could just run Zhongli and Shangling on the same team and do Toma's job and then some. So ultimately, for most of you, he's going to be like Sayu where you'll probably mainly use him for his non-combat related passive, which in Toma's case is a 20% chance to double your catch whenever you go fishing, which admittedly is pretty helpful for those of you working towards getting R5 catch for your Raiden or someone else. If you don't give a shit though, and you want to main him anyway because the male wife 
life power is too strong. Give him ER spears because the only HP spear, Black Tassel, has a passive that's useless on him, though you can use it on him anyway, especially if he's C4. In most cases though, Favonius or Skyward Spine is his go-to. You could give him Engulfing Lightning, Catch, or Star Glitter, but they have passives that make them more suited on characters who can actually do damage, unlike Toma. And since he does fuck all for damage, you can forget about giving him crit stats and keep things simple by giving him HP% percent pieces, with maybe an ER timepiece for his 80 cost ult if you need it. 4-piece Noblesse is his best set for more support, followed by 2-piece Tenacity and 2-piece Emblem. Five star Electro off field DPS caster. Hot damn, I love me some good fox girls. Tamamonomaya's skill is a glide that goes forward in a direction you're holding and backwards if there's no movement input. Near the end of her glide, Miko then drops an Electro Totem at her location that starts zapping the shit out of enemies nearby. She can stock up to three glides at once, and she can have a maximum of three totems up at any given time. You're pretty much playing a mini tower defense game whenever you use her, which obviously means that Miko's going to be the featured six star operator in that Arc Knights and Genshin Impact collaboration we're going to get at some point, right? If she places her totems within range of each other, they link up like Wi-Fi range extenders and boost each other's powers. So whenever you whip out Miko to put down her totems, make sure to place them in a triangular formation, like you're drawing pentagrams in Space Station 13. Be careful with her gliding though, even though it looks like a regular dash, it doesn't have any iframes, so Miko can get hit out of it at any point if she's too close to enemies. A lot of the time, you'll be setting her totems down right up in their faces though, so to an extent you can't really avoid that unless you put down a taunt, or set up a shield first, or just iframe everything because your favorite game designer is Hidetaka Miyazaki. Suzuka Gozen's ult, instead of raining swords down on people because that's kind of someone else's job in this game, rains down lightning strikes like she's a killstreak in Black Ops 2. She calls down a big lightning strike first onto the location of the nearest enemy, and the ult calls down more to follow up depending on the number of totems she had on the field when she ulted. The easiest way to describe Miko is this. She's fischl, but on three types of crack and a can of Ultra Rosa Monster. Koyan Sky is all about her skill totems. Having three of them up is like having three Oz's whose shots don't miss and have no travel time because they're no longer projectiles. So, with proper investment and all three totems up, she can just kick back to drink some boba with Ayato and watch everyone else get zapped to death while reading My Dress Up Darling. Like Fish and Raiden, there are two ways to play adult suzerain, passive and active. Passive is, as you'd expect, a simple skill bot who just shits out skill totems on demand to provide constant off-field electro DPS. But for a more alpha bitch playstyle, give her a healthy amount of ER and pair her with an electro teammate, preferably Raiden or Sarah, and spam her ult as much as possible. Her first passive instantly refunds her skill charges when she ults, one for each totem that she already had down, so she can loop her skills and ult indefinitely with the only thing stopping her from doing that being the cooldown on her ult. Adult Senko's best weapon is Kagura, obviously. Mihoyo's gotta sell their 5-star weapons somehow. I mean, it was on raid up with fucking Jade Cutter back when it was out, so for once the weapon banner wasn't actually a scam like Lakari streams are most of the time. Unless you hit the 25%, then get fucked. If you don't have Kagura, then give her the next best DPS catalyst you got. With Sith should be a great cheaper option, assuming you don't get the EN buff, because even when taking her second passive into account, you'd rather get the other two buffs instead. Nina Kosaka has two default artifact sets, two-piece Thundering Fury with the two-piece attack set for a balanced DPS profile or four-piece emblem, which helps her ult rotations a lot if you're not running her with her girlfriend Raiden. Four-piece Tenacity is good for a passive or support Nico, though you probably shouldn't go out of your way to farm Tenacity pieces specifically unless you're trying to farm Pale Flame pieces first. 4-piece Thunder Soother is also incredibly potent if your skill rotations are on point and you run the Fox Girl in Taser teams. Five Star Pyro DPS Archer. Rin found that she can't chuck gems constantly as attacks in Genshin like Ningguang can, so she took a leaf out of Emiya's book and became an archer who spams fire arrows instead. The archer class actually is made up of archers, holy shit who would have thought. Ishtar's skill is an install. She does a short animation that both buffs her normal attacks and converts them into pyro damage for a short period of time. 
the animation itself is like Sarah's skill, and that on its own, it does no damage to enemies nearby. But interestingly, it will stagger lightweight enemies a little to give her space to start blasting like Hu Tao's does. Don't try this on bigger enemies for obvious reasons. Ereshigal's ult has her jump high up into the air and blast the nearest enemy with a firework that deals AoE pyro damage. Note that this is an actual projectile she has to shoot, so be mindful of your surroundings if there are geo constructs on the field or something that could potentially block her shot. Once the shot goes off, it then marks the enemy it hit with a debuff. If it hits multiple enemies, it'll mark whoever Yoimi was auto-targeting at the time. When any of your party members, except Yoimi herself, hits the marked enemy with any of their own attacks, they'll detonate the mark and have it do more AoE pyro damage to that enemy. If their first enemy dies, it'll jump to the nearest available enemy, and it'll keep chaining like this until it expires on its own. Riol is a straightforward DPS character. Press E first, then spam left click until everything's dead. If you've main Fischl as an actual DPS and not just as a turret bot, then playing Yoime should come naturally to you. Then again, how hard is mashing left click anyway? Her charge attack does have its own unique quirk in that similar to Ganyu, it has a second level of charge where she can gain up to three smaller arrows that track the nearest enemy when she shoots. But unlike Ganyu's level 2 charge shot, the extra arrows Yomiya gets from hers don't really do that much damage. Not only that, but when she pops her skill, her charge shots become unable to get those extra fire shots anyway, so for the most part you don't use Yomiya's charge shot unless you're just memeing. And since her ult doesn't do all that much damage on its own either, Skyfire is one of the few DPSs in the game who rely exclusively on their normals as their main source of damage, making her one of Yunjin's best teammates and vice versa. So for talent priority, level up her normal attacks first. Leveling her skill doesn't boost her normal attack damage as much as leveling the normals themselves does. One thing that Space Ishtar excels at though is proccing Overload. Traditionally, Overload is a hard reaction to work with because it knocks lightweight enemies back, making it hard for most melee characters to follow up on triggering an Overload reaction. But Yoimi is an archer, she can just snipe enemies from downtown like Steph Curry hitting threes, and since the initial Overload reaction forces lighter targets to become airborne, her follow-up shots, if they're close enough, will keep bouncing them further up into the air like she's juggling them in a versus game. She can miss a few shots here and there, but that's better than most other characters who have to use stamina to chase down their targets most of the time. Partly for this reason, she's also great to farm spectral mats with. Spectres are airborne, and depending on their movement can be hard for melee characters to hit sometimes, but Yoimiya, on the other hand, doesn't give a fuck and aimbots them to death. Not only that, but Spectres are resistant to Overload knockback, so they'll just kind of float in place while Yoimiya shoves fire arrows down their throats with the help of Raiden, Mika, or Official. She can also be this weird damage support type too. Because her ult's chain reaction effect doesn't proc when Yoimiya herself attacks marked enemies and only her teammates can, you can just run her as an ult bot who applies persistent pyro onto enemies, and her second passive does somewhat incentivize this sort of playstyle, but it's very inefficient compared to other characters who already do that, like Shangling. If you're gonna invest into Yoimiya at all, it should be to make use of her pyro damage normals. Thundering Pulse, Polar Star, and Harp are her best 5 star options, with Pulse being her best choice because she works best with its passive. Ammo Spell is also pretty good too, in case you have a spare from its most recent raid up, with Ganyu's rerun banner thanks to Yoimiya's effective ranges. Rust is by far her best 4 star option, and if you don't have that, then give her your next best offensive 4 star bow. 2 piece Crimson and 2 piece Attack is her default set, it's a balanced loadout that works for Yoimiya in all situations. 4 piece Shimanawa is fantastic if you don't care about using her ult, which to be fair, most of the time, you shouldn't, and 4 piece Crimson is also great on a reaction based Yoimiya, which should be all the time, especially with a Raiden teammate. Four-piece Lava Walker is a more, uh, meme set, but worth considering if you don't mind a pyro-only damage team, and you got nothing but Lava Walker pieces while trying to farm Crimson ones anyway. That covers all the Inazuma characters, which means we're almost done here. Let's finish with the last two characters we haven't covered yet since they aren't affiliated with any region. 5 star cryo burst support archer. No one knows how she got here or why she's here, but hey, she's a free 5 star character that most of you won't use, in part because you're too busy playing Elden Ring. One thing's for sure, that switch port for Genshin still won't be showing up anytime soon. White Gold's skill is an ice bomb that she chucks at the nearest enemy which blows up on impact and does AoE cryo damage, either when it hits an enemy or the ground if you whiff. It also puts an attack debuff on all the enemies that it hits. After it blows up, it drops 6 smaller 
Stellar Bombs that are basically the cryo version of Klee's Cluster Bombs, and they spawn in random locations within the initial Ice Bombs blast. And like Klee's Cluster Bombs, Alloy's Small Bombs can also be CC'd with certain Animo skills. This is actually more important than Alloy than it is for Klee, because Alloy's skill gives her stacks that eventually infuse her normals with cryo if she gets enough of them. When she first chucks her Ice Bomb and it hits an enemy, it gives her a stack, and every small bomb that also hits an enemy gives her another stack. Just on their own, each of these stacks gives Alloy a normal attack buff, but when she gets 4 stacks, she hits her max normal attack bonus and her normals then get infused with cryo damage for some time. Her stacks get cleared the moment she gets 4 and she can't get any new ones until her cryo damage infusion expires first. While she has stacks before she reaches max, she can hold them indefinitely so long as she's the active character, but if you switch her out, she can hold them for up to 30 seconds before they expire on their own. Though she can get stacks even when she's swapped out if enemies run into her small bombs. Sterling's Silver's ult is a bigger version of her skill, just with that stack mechanic. She throws a cryo bomb towards the nearest opponent and shoots it in midair to detonate it in a big ass AoE cryo blast like she's doing a trick shot for Dude Perfect. That's all it does, but it has an incredibly short cooldown, and it's only 40 cost, making it spammable like Chong Yun's ult or any other ult that's only 40 cost. Silicon Steel is best used for her ult, despite it not having any utility except freeze, I guess, but clearly there are better characters for that. She can be used for her cryo infused normals, but the main problem with this playstyle is that her stack acquisition is unreliable at best, since it's dependent on enemies running into the small bombs, and if they don't, those small bombs just kind of sit there doing nothing useful. So that means you'd have to run Animo teammates with her who can force the bombs to blow up on enemies by CCing them, but then that would mean that Alloy is then reliant on them, which may restrict the kinds of teams you want to use her in, especially if you plan on running her in specific reaction-centered teams like Reverse Melt. A smaller but still notable problem is that Alloy's normals themselves aren't very good good compared to other archers' normals. The scaling on them is noticeably worse, and her auto combo itself causes her to back away considerably from her target, especially the animation on her fourth shot, which makes her do a backwards combat roll. Range isn't usually a problem for archers, but it can be for alloy, specifically since her skill is a projectile, and can miss if her target moves right when she throws it, and so being further away from an enemy increases the chance of her whiffing her skill. TLDR, if you want to run a normal attack archer, go play Official or Yomi instead. So, her most consistent playstyle centers around her spammable ult, preferably in a reverse melt team. But since the cryo roster is one of the most stacked elements in the game, it's hard to justify using Alloy over someone like Ayaka, who just puts you in a blender and murders you, or even Kea, who has a much stronger ult in terms of utility. Daily reminder that people thought Ganyu was going to be a cryo amber. If you're one of the four people out there who still want to use her because you liked Horizon Zero Dawn or Forbidden West, then any of the 5 star bows can be good on her, but Stringless is her go to option if she's reverse melting. Alternatively, she can use Sack Bow at higher refinements since her skill generates an abnormally high number of energy particles, so she can function as a cryo battery, funnily enough. Artifact set varies on your alloy's playstyle. 4 piece Blizzard is optimal for Freeze, 4 piece Emblem or 2 piece Blizzard with 2 piece Noblesse are probably her two best generalist sets, and 2 piece Wanderers is optimal for Reverse Melt. For what it's worth, Alloy is also one of the game's best 4 piece noblesse holders, so consider that if your team doesn't already have someone with that set. 5 star variable flex saber, which makes me sound like Phil Swift trying to sell you the next generation of flex tape. The main character of Genshin, who speaks like 7 words per region. At the beginning of the game, you can choose to be one of the twins, Aether or Lumen. There's no gameplay difference between them, only aesthetic ones, and you can't swap between them because of story reasons, so you have to commit to one twin or the other. So decide on who your favorite twin is and pick wisely no pressure. On an unrelated note, I went with Lumen because she's cute and she's voiced by Aoi Yuki, just thought I'd let you know. They are the only character in the game who can switch elements at all, though they can only do so if you visit a statue of the Seven in one of the available regions. Mondstadt gives you Nemo, which is your starting element, Liyue gives you Geo, and Inazuma gives you Electro, and future regions will give you access to other elements, or at least that's what we assume. Let's start with Nemo first. Their skill is a short-range Nemo Vortex that has a tap or hold version 
version. Tapping it knocks lightweight enemies back a bit and does a Nemo damage to them. Holding it charges up the skill, and enemies within its AoE take constant Nemo damage while it's charging up until the twins release it automatically, doing more Nemo damage to them. The charging process can suck in lighter enemies so that Aether or Lumen can smack them with a Nemo like how... well... You know. This skill can also absorb one of the four absorbable elements and does extra damage of that type, similar to many of the other Animo abilities in the game. Their ult is the Gust move from Pokemon. After a short cast time, they throw out a small Animo tornado that rapidly moves forward, sucking in any light enemy in its path and dragging them with it, dealing constant Animo damage to them all the while, and it has the same elemental absorption mechanic as their skill. Unfortunately, the tornado has two fatal flaws. The first is that it doesn't launch enemies like a lot of other Animo skills and ults do. So even though it's meant to give smaller enemies the good suck, that suck ain't that good, since they can kind of still move around while they're getting sucked off. Combine that with the tornado's fast travel speed, and enemies can just straight up escape the tornado on their own before the tornado itself expires. The second is the tornado's movement. Since it constantly travels forward, it'll drag light enemies away from you, which isn't what you want since you'd rather keep them in range of your team, so that your characters can actually keep hitting them and do constant reaction damage to them, and you'll have to chase after your own tornado to catch up to enemies that it drags away. The tornado is also just straight up bad against Against bigger enemies since not only are they resistant to the suck, but also the tornado is just going to go right past them, kind of like what happens when you use Luigi's tornado move in melee most of the time. What should happen is that it should stop when it runs through a big enemy, that way it can stay in place and keep doing damage to them, but since it doesn't, all the tornado is really going to do is crowd control, namely during those defense phases in Abyss that you all hate doing. They're best used as an Animo DPS, mainly to spam their skill and do their best Rock Howard impression. Use their ult whenever appropriate, though I feel like it'll be more useful as like invul frames than as an actual damage ult. Surprisingly, you can build them for either EM or conventional crit stats and they'll perform similarly, which means that their weapon options are also mostly interchangeable between the two build types, so give them your best sword option, including the elemental mastery swords like Freedom Sworn and Iron Sting. 4-piece Viridescent is their default because they're, well, a Nemo. If you don't have enough Viridescent pieces, then just run them with 2-piece attack sets instead. Now for Geo. The twins have their skill changed to a Geo construct. Many of you will recognize this from all the cock and ball picks that people took back when Zhongli became playable, which is actually rather appropriate in the sense that the Twins' Geo skill is the free-to-play version of Zhongli's skill. It's a Geo construct, so you can use it to block enemy attacks or climb onto to do exploration stuff. And of course, it does AoE Geo damage if it hits enemies when you first use it. Tapping it makes it track the nearest enemy and drops a fat rock on it, while the hold version lets you pinpoint exactly where you want it and the rock hits him from below instead. Of note, holding this skill is actually much faster faster than tapping it if you dash cancel it, so if you're a rare Giga Chad Traveler main, practice using their hold skill for better mobility. Their ult is a Geo Shockwave that does AoE Geo damage, kinda like Magneto's Shockwave Super in MVC3, except it goes in all directions. It knocks lightweight enemies back if they're within range of the Shockwave, and where the Shockwave ends, it puts up three Geo walls that are also treated as Geo constructs, so they can block enemy attacks too, though you can't climb or jump over them, I don't think. Because both their skill and ult produce constructs, the Geo Twins excel in crowd control specifically by dividing up enemy forces and letting you take on parts of them at a time rather than face them all at once. This gives them pretty good utility for those annoying tower defense floors in Abyss in case you don't have better CC options, though keep in mind that sometimes you can end up hampering your own movement too because, well, there's just so much shit everywhere. Their Geo skill specifically is great for those floors due to its big girth, which covers a sizable area to protect protect the OBJ. And well, to be fair, you'd need pretty big balls to unironically bring Geo Traveler into those last four floors of Abyss in the first place. Other than their utility, the twins can also use Geo for good burst damage since unlike their Animo kit, they can actually put their entire Geo kit to use, so mostly the same weapon options from their Animo version still apply here, just without, you know, the EM sword since Elemental Mastery is whack for Geo characters. Their default set should be two-piece archaic and a two-piece attack set, but if you'd rather focus on their ult, either for its damage or more frequent use or even both, then 2-piece noblesse and or 2-piece emblem is fine too. Also consider 4-piece emblem or even double 2-piece attack sets if you don't have a variety of 5-star artifacts available yet. 
And finally, for now, Electro. For their skill, Len and Rin throw out three Electro Blades forward in a spread pattern that dissipate after a short travel distance. On hit, they do Electro damage and drop little amulets near the location where they hit their targets. They can drop a maximum of two, depending on how they hit the enemies, or three gems at C1. For most consistent amulet drops, just barrel stuff the fucking enemies with it. The amulets themselves take a few seconds to coalesce before you can pick them up. And when you do, they not only give your active character energy directly, but also increase their energy energy recharge for a short time. So if there's a teammate who needs that energy, you have some time to back off, switch to that character, and then go pick up the amulets with them. Note about the amulets, if you barrel stuff enemies with a skill like I suggested you to, it'll usually group them all up very close together, so it makes it tough to distribute the amulets individually to different characters if that's what you want to do. You probably wouldn't want to dedicate the time to doing something like that anyway, especially not combat, so for the most part assume that only one character is going to be able to make use of all those amulets. Their ult is like a baby version of Miko's ult and Raiden's skill combined. On activation, it blasts all enemies in an area around the twins with Electro and knocks them back if they're lightweight. Afterwards, your active characters' normals and charge attacks have mini lightning strikes that also attack your target and regen energy for them for a short period of time. Electro Traveler is all about energy regen, so they're mostly relegated to a hard support role here, which probably makes this their simplest element in terms of playstyle as all they need to care about is being a battery for the rest of the team. Think of them as Raiden, but without a super broken ult. Use their skill as often as you can at close range, and they ult the instant they get it for maximum energy recharging, and that's pretty much it. So, support swords work best on them, obviously. Favonius, Sack Sword, Scoured Blade, Festering Desire, or even Scoured Sword if you're that poor. For Sack Sword, keep in mind that the energy amulets get reset if you use the skill twice, so as big of a sacrificial set fanboy as I am, I don't think it'll be that much better than Favonius, if at all, here. Four Piece Noblesse is their default set. If your Electro Traveler turns out to have good crit stats to do some good damage with, then Four Piece Emblem is a good alternative, assuming you don't have any other 4 stars who also want that shit too. But since the twins don't have great damage scaling as Electro, just stack as much energy recharge as you can on them with 2-piece emblem and ER substats and call it a day. Three hours and 48 characters later, here we are finally at the end. I hope you found this video entertaining and not a waste of the last three hours of your time, and maybe you even got something out of it other than finding out how much of a fucking whale I am, because contrary to popular belief, spending a lot of money on pixels on your computer or phone screen is not what makes you special. If you take nothing else away from this video, know this, that despite what some random whale on YouTube making a three hour long video about your favorite gacha game might tell you about the characters in it, and how to play them, and what kinds of gear you should give them for optimal gameplay, you should play them however you want. Because I might think that those people on Twitter who kept asking me Hoyo for another Vortex Vanquisher rate up are weird, but at least they aren't pretending to be meta whores who insist that you should throw your bank account out the window to go broke for multiple R5 copies of Homa. Just enjoy the game for what it is. Yes, this is a gotcha, so by nature you most likely won't get every character the game has to offer, certainly not every 5 star. But if and when you do, maybe you can come back to this video or others like it and see how they can be played. And now it's time for me to shill my brains out. I stream over at twitch.tv forward slash toasniper98 and I stream a variety of gotchas like Genshin, FGO, Arknights, and Blue Archive, as well as some random FPS games if I feel like streaming those, so go check out the stream to catch me live would mean a lot. I also plan on making individual character how-to videos for Genshin Impact in the future, and the first one will be on Mona, which I'll work on once I get some other side projects done first. And finally, least of all, I write fanfiction in my free time. Not terribly good ones, but I try. The one I'm working on right now is a quintessential quintuplets one, or Gotobo no Hanayome if you want to go by the Japanese name, though I haven't updated it in a while because I've been working on this video and really should. 
In the pinned comment below, I should have a pastebin link or a Google Doc that has links to the fan art, memes, and music I've used throughout the video, or at least as many as I could find for them. And, of course, thanks for watching.